Welcome to Innovation Rodeo 2022. I am your host, Jason Seibel from the Air Force Security Forces Center, Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center, and we are here to rodeo. That's right, it is Innovation Rodeo 2022, live streaming from Techport San Antonio, and we are here in the best location in the world to bring our teams from across the enterprise together to pitch their ideas to the judges. Techport Center and Arena is the heartbeat of Port San Antonio's 1900 acre technology innovation campus. It is a national hub for innovation and strategic convergence by DOD, industry, academia, community partners and other stakeholders. Located minutes away from Air Force IMSC headquarters, Techport provides an ideal ecosystem for matching individual talent to technology for our Air Force innovators. This state-of-the-art facility shifts the needle forward for both San Antonio and the Air Force IMSC Innovation Mission. Now, before we meet this year's judges, let's hear from the Air Force IMSC Commander, Major General John Allen. Good morning, innovators, judges, and viewers. We're coming to you live streaming from San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to our fourth annual Innovation Rodeo at the Air Force Installation and Mission Support Center. Um, this is my first as the IMSC commander, so it is particularly exciting for me to be a part of this. I'm sorry I'm not in this room. Uh, I'm on the road actually, but I, I, I'm with you in spirit. Uh, this is really, really important business for our Air Force. We have world-class innovators all over our Air Force and the best, most important innovation, in my view, is the innovation that's happening closest to the problems we're trying to solve and the innovations that are brought in by the, by the great people that have the best vantage point of those, of those problems. So we have eight uh, finalists down selected from 72 really great ideas that we're looking at uh, this week. Uh, we have a million dollars waiting to help uh, prototype, beta test, and better understand the very best of, those, of these eight uh, innovation uh, ideas, uh, and hopefully to move to scaling around our Air Force if that's what our beta test and prototype says is the right thing to do. So I'm thrilled that we're doing this. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Uh, thank you for the time of uh, uh, being here uh, and being a part of what we're doing this week. I look forward to a wonderful, uh, wonderful rest of the week. Innovate away. Thank you, General Allen, and innovate away indeed. I am your host, but more importantly, we've got six judges on the stage with me, and it is now my pleasure and honor to introduce them to you. From Air Force IMSC, Ms. J.D. Purdy. Thanks so much, Jason. Good afternoon. As you mentioned, J.D. Purdy here, Chief Innovation Officer at AFIMSC. Personally, I'm excited to be here because this is the end of the week, a culmination of the hard work for these eight individuals to showcase all of the great effort and time and things that they've learned about not only themselves, but their innovation. Can't wait to see what they've got to bring to us today. From AFIMSC, Colonel Kelly Sands. Thanks, Jason. I too, JD, am excited to be here. I'm the vice commander at AFIMSC, and I am just really impressed with the energy and the ideas of not only the presenters today, but the teams of, of airmen and guardians that are behind them. So let's get it on. From AFIMSC, Mr. Samuel Grable. Yeah, well, good afternoon. Uh, I am the director of installation support at, at AFIMSC, and uh, you know, I'm a lifelong resource manager, financial manager in the Air Force and, and other places. So. The idea of innovation as a way to reduce costs or do things smarter, faster, better really kind of hits home to me, so I'm really looking forward to this afternoon. From the Air Force Security Forces Center, Mr. Gerard Jolivet. Good afternoon. I too am excited to be here. I've uh, become familiar with uh, a number of the pitches that we're going to receive this afternoon, and as the general said, from 72 to this small number, I'm excited, and uh, actually I look forward to it, so like I said, Let's get it on. All right, let's get it on. From the Air Force Services Center, Colonel Carolyn Ammons. It is great to be up here with these teammates, and I'm excited to see what the young airmen, young, I say young from my perspective, from the installations bringing up so we can look at it from an enterprise level across the Air Force. So at the Services Center, 
as we help folks, airmen's families, guardians, uh, globally. I'm interested in seeing how this goes forward. Super excited. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, from the Air Force Services Center, Chief Master Sergeant Edgar Castillo. Uh, good afternoon. Super excited to be here as well. The SEL for the Services Center. Uh, super excited to see their pitches uh, in a tough time with all the resources challenges that we're having. Interested to see what they have to pitch. Excellent. We're excited as well, JD. They've had a very interesting week. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of went on uh, th the last few days? Across the globe, across the enterprise, different portfolios, different statuses, and they came together on Monday with some professional trainers to teach them, as one individual said, uh, essentially lost or decided not to do how Air Force breaks anymore and need to learn to really do how to pitch. So they spent a lot of time really not only perfecting their pitch abilities, but perfecting and uh, working on some of the pieces and parts of their pitch and whether it's scalable, who their stakeholders might be. So really digging into what they're about to share with us to perfect it, to, to make it as good as it can be for this really large audience. So that's been a week long effort culminating here this afternoon. I'm, I'm excited to hear their pitches. I know you all are excited to hear their pitches. Now that we've heard a little bit about how this week went, we actually had cameras follow them around from earlier this week. So let's take a look on the screen and see exactly what they went through building up to Innovation Rodeo 2022. The really interesting thing is that the training is really designed to make the airmen feel comfortable and remove those insecurities and any barriers ahead of making that final pitch. Uh, as a support team, we're here to make the, um, the contestants feel much more comfortable and really make them feel at ease when they're presenting. I, I realise that's not a question, it's just that... Um, that could happen. Yeah. You could get a question. There are a number of um, functional experts here and subject matter experts to help the innovators develop their ideas and their pitches ahead of the uh, big day on Friday. You know, we get innovations pushed through our career field every day as security forces. Uh, everybody's trying to make things better, so it's really, really a great opportunity to help push things through that can make a big difference for our career field. You need to see where a TCP and ECP is stepping out of your comfort zone you know you want you want to be able to talk to people if you're not very comfortable with that you want to be able to be stand up in front of people be articulate and be able to voice what you're trying to sell and get it out there in a fashionable manner personal goal is really for me personally is to highlight the, the team their effort this project that we're working at Eglin but also to show that it can be replicated uh, across other bases, centers, and even match comms and Air Force level um, requirements. Step forward, just put your idea forward and, and just push it as far and as hard as you can. And if it fails, it fails, but you've learned from it and it just, it'll open up another door as well. All right, we are backstage here at Tech Port Center and Arena in Port San Antonio, live streaming from backstage. So we've got the dressing rooms all set up here for our contestants, our eight contestants who are getting ready to pitch to these judges. Uh, before they do, though, we want to just kind of peek in and see what they're thinking. So let's go in here and check out uh, the first uh, set of contestants that are up. Hey, and they are up and ready to go for us. Hey, guys, uh, we got Brandon Harris and we got Chaplain PJ Werner here. Brandon, how you feeling? Well, I'm feeling great. It's been a great week of training. I am ready to give this pitch and kick off this rodeo. Well, you are kicking it off indeed, Innovation Rodeo 2022. You're the first member up. Do you feel prepared after this week of, uh, of coaching and training to, to give your pitch? I do. I do. I do feel prepared. I'm a little bit worried about the Q&A from the judges, but I think I got that handled as well. Okay. Well, I was just up there with them. They're all very nice, I assure you. So they'll go easy. Chaplain uh, Werner, PJ here, how you feeling? So good. Absolutely outstanding. Okay, excellent. And are you ready to give your pitch? You got the butterflies a little bit? Just a little bit. I've been praying them down all day. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that, PJ. All right, thanks so much. Brandon, you're actually the first one up, so let's get you out there and pitch to the judges. Let's do it. All right. Brandon, we can't wait to hear what's going on with you. Come on out.
Similar to this image of the Hubble telescope on the, your left-hand side, when we look at contracting data, we see hundreds of data points throughout the acquisition life cycle. To manage all of those data points, we're required to fill out a workload tracker every day. But this means that we won't be spending as much time uh, visiting the construction site, or we won't be spending as much time developing the body armor requirements. Instead, we're spending our time manually filling out a workload tracker, even though this information is found in an acquisition system. Well, what if there was an automated solution? A solution that will take all of these data points, combine them into one website, accessible not just to contracting, but also to our mission partners. Similar to this image of the Hubble telescope, a solution that will zoom in on these data points and allow contracting and our mission partners the ability to get a better insight into their acquisition. Acquisition visibility, or ACVIS, is that solution. Next slide. ACVIS removes the time that contracting personnel spend manually filling out a workload tracker by creating a consolidated database. It's going to combine seven legacy systems. It's going to eliminate the need for manual inputs. And it's going to repurpose contracting efforts back to the things that matter the most. You'll see here, this is an example of what an ActViz dashboard would look like. The column on the left-hand side, those are the common reports we look at when we're tracking the uh, acquisition throughout its life cycle. Next slide. The need is there. I surveyed hundreds of contracting personnel. 89% hate their current workload tracker. People are spending four hours on average every week filling these things out. 91% want an automated tracker. In fact, one of the comments I got back from the survey was filling out manual trackers is similar to rabbits multiplying. We're creating trackers just to track other trackers. The momentum is there as well. 87% say my idea is a viable option. Probably the biggest concern was they think it's too complex, but if you can fill out a spreadsheet, you know how to do charts and graphs, then you can use ActVis. It's at the unit level. We are currently implementing ActVis at the 50th Contracting Squadron. And it's a proven concept. One of the seven systems is already live right now. You can go out there to the website and see this data for yourself. My idea is to scale this up. Take all seven of these acquisition systems, combine them into one database, and then publish it for everyone. Next slide. As far as stakeholders are concerned, ActViz aligns with AFICC and AFICC Business Intelligence Team's initiative to optimize our workload trackers. Also, AFIMSC Innovation Team also sees the value added in implementing ActViz. But the main stakeholders are any unit out there that use contracting for their purchasing. Next slide. I'm asking for two to six weeks for startup, test, and launch of ActViz. I'm also asking for ac access to all contracting unit data. Now, I personally have access to all these seven systems, but I just have it for my unit alone. So I would need to get access to all the contracting unit data just so we can make it one consolidated database. And I'm asking for $349,000. 182,000 the first year and 167,000 post year one. You're gonna hear seven other amazing ideas today. With ActViz, each one of them can become a reality faster because you're gonna be giving that time back to the contracting officers, allowing them to do what they do best. Thank you. Do you have any questions for me? Brandon, thanks so much for that. I'll go ahead and kick it off. Thanks for breaking down the numbers, what you're asking for, and that level of detail. 
As somebody who's probably going to help be responsible for a winner and a sustainment tail, judges and I have already talked about this. When you say post year one, that $180,000 Seven thousand dollars is that for per year, or is that one and done? Talk to me a little bit about that. Yes, ma'am. Think of post year one as sustainment. So first year 180, 182, and then one sixty seven every year afterwards. I, I get the feeling that if we're going to go uh, the first year, it would be good to have a second year available as well. Yeah, thanks for thinking about that. It was one of the major conversations we had as judges. Anybody else like to ask any questions for Brandon? I have a question if I may. So. As we, as you gain all the other units in, right? Let's say we get 87 units. Will that tail end increase the year on after? So the first year you'll have two or three units. Let's say the, the second year you have 40 units. Will that tail end support cost go up, or is just 187 all the way? It's it's 187 the first year, chief, and then it'll be 167 every year in the out years. I have a question as well. Um, Brandon, is there a concern, a security concern, aggregating all that data together uh, from a department perspective? From a department perspective, I'm going off of what the one system's already doing. Uh, the one, it's already been out there. There's been no security concerns when I talk to the developers of that one system that's already published uh, with um, the similarity to ActThis. If there's any concern, then that would actually be able to be uh, controlled by us. Say, for instance, if there's contractors you don't want to see that data, we can easily uh, shut down access to those specific groups if we want to. Yes, ma'am. Brandon, I'm up next. Are you familiar with the uh, ATO, Authority to Operate process, and how does it apply here in respect to the complexity of gaining that authority? Yes, uh, sir. So I have talked to AFICC about the ATO process, and in our discussions, because the servers that I want to use are already ATO approved. There is no ATO issue with this. Thank you. Hey, Brandon, great job. Tell me a little bit about the team that's supporting you. I have, my champion is uh, Colonel Karen Landell. Uh, I think she was on the stage in 2019, so she's been very helpful. And she's been a great supporter of this. I have um, the AFICC um, Roger Westermeyer, mm -hmm. who's also been a, a, a big supporter of this. And I have uh, Peter Herman from the uh, AFICC Business Intelligence Team, who is also, we've, we've talked a lot about the concept and the idea behind this at this. So if it's implemented, how would you take the databases and then proliferate them across the Air Force? Because it sounds a little bit like you have the knowledge. Just walk me yes. through that a little bit. So I spent a year building the algorithm in the background. Every one of these seven systems are siloed. So my idea is to download them. Uh, part of the money will go towards a, a contractor, and the, the contractor who understands how the database works, download it, take my algorithm, combine it into one, and then upload it for everybody to see. So in the beginning, yes, phase one would be, okay, we have to go in twice a day because we want the most current data. We'll have to go in twice a day to download it and then upload it. In the future, we are looking at maybe, let's do a bot. Let's automatically do that. But for right now, yes. You said you've, uh, you've implemented it for one system. Yes, sir. Or tested it. What did you learn from that, that test or that implementation phase? I just talked to the developers the other day about this. I learned that that one system right now has, on average, 1,500 users. 1,500 users to 2,000 users every day are already using one system. So that tells me that there is a demand out there, that people like what this product is doing. It's easy for them to use. So I'm just thinking, wait till we get all seven in there. And have you aggregated, uh, you talked about four hours per person per week. Yes, sir. I didn't see on the charts, like, as I estimate the 167K per year, what's the savings, what's the projected savings? Let's say you get to the X number of base level contracting squadrons or whatever it may be. What, have you done any, any of that aggregation yet? Or uh, Yes, sir. Well, in savings, it's about 1.3 million. Because when we looked at, we did some assumptions about how many hours, four hours expands. It's about 20,000 hours a year. And then when we look at a GS-12 and we expand that out, it's about 1.3 million in savings. And when I say savings, it's not that this is money going back to the Air Force. We're repurposing those hours. We're repurposing 20,000 hours back to the contracting officers and the contracting specialists so they can do their job. One of the things for me, I'm obviously interested in the, the, um, 
yeah, I naturally thought, hey, aren't there contractors that do this? And you mentioned, hey, uh, part of this would be toward a contractor to support. Mm -hmm. is, it st is this sort of, um, I don't want to say dashboarding, but the, the accumulation of, of data systems into something that's a more manageable um, process, is that something that's proliferate, proliferating uh, outside of uh, your organization, the DOD, uh, where you could just import it? Yes, sir. So there are, it is proliferating. And I looked at other systems out there, and I guess the, the takeaway for mine is mine's agile. Because these other systems, they're looking for, uh, oh, they don't have all seven of these systems right now. None of the systems have these that I looked at. And they're looking, instead of uh, weeks, they're looking at months to years to add these. So I'm trying to get this out faster, quicker. And if you have, oh, I have an eighth system, I can bring that in in weeks. Where then they have to go through all the process, paperwork, approval for those different types of systems. Brandon. Can I ask one last yes, Chief. Sure, Chief. For, for, so it's obviously going to save time for the COs and CSs, right? What about the customer? Will it give me an option to go in as a customer that's doing a purchase or to go in and see what the status is? Yes, absolutely, Chief. So I look at the end users, like acquisition are the end users for us, the contracting specialists, but then it's the visibility. That is for you as the leader. If there's taskers that come down, you can easily go to this database and there's already training out there about how to develop dashboards or everything, the idea would be also to give you a standardized template and say, okay, these are the, these are the, how we want this to look. Do you like this? No? Okay, build your own. You can build your own if you want so that you as the end user could see that the, the real-time tracking of your acquisitions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brandon, on behalf of all Airmen and Guardians and the Installation Emission Support Portfolio, thank you so much for the time and effort that it took you on your own to build us, bring us to us, the passion that brought you to this stage today, and then the, all the time and effort that you put in this week as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, oh, you guys, what a start to Innovation Rodeo 2022. I mean, I know that was the first pitch, but I'm all in. Like business intelligence, software, that's the quantum leap forward with, that the service needs, right, uh, JD? I mean, need it. that's what we're looking for for Innovation Rodeo. What did you think of that pitch? So we've had a chance to get to know Brandon over the last couple of days and talking about this system and the question comes up, why aren't we doing this already? So super proud of Brandon for identifying this need, having the, the, uh, the smarts to go after it as well, right organically within his team. So I think this is just a great example of organic innovation rising up to the rodeo. Super excited about that. Yeah, absolutely. He had his numbers down. I mean, all of his answers to your guys' his questions were right on point. Mr. Grable, you kind of had a had a pretty good conversation there with him. What did you think of that pitch? Well, I liked it. I mean, uh, we see we see these kinds of things in industry. The idea of bringing it into the Air Force and a, in particularly in the contracting, it makes a lot of sense. And I I personally liked the idea of using. Uh, we know it's cost avoidance you know you're, you're basically moving from you know hours used to do something you can automate and the idea of using those hours to do better things for you know customers for war fighters if you will certainly resonates with me well we love to say work smarter not harder right and i think business intelligence software that's the direction to go here's the good news that's pitch one we got seven more awesome pitches to hear for innovation rodeo 2022 our next pitcher is Chaplain PJ Werner. He is back there. He's ready to go. JD, you ready to hear it? Let's bring on PJ. All right, let's do it. Here comes PJ Werner. August 2018, I got the call that every chaplain fears. There's been a suicide. Over the weeks that followed, I got to know the airman's family and friends, and through them, I got a full picture of a young man who was loved, appreciated, but he was hiding his emotional pain, silently suffering to the point where he felt like he had no choices. When you feel like you have no choices, you feel hopeless. 
I'm Chaplain Werner, and today you have the opportunity to give better choices to our airmen. Next slide, please. The DOD suicide event report has shown consistently that in the months leading up to a suicidal event, there is usually a relationship, workplace, or legal stressor. Our current suicide prevention has been amazing at normalizing our ability to talk about suicide. It is, however, by definition, reactive and requires an outside party to see the depressive symptoms and get the person to a helping agency. Meanwhile, the University of Pennsylvania has been unlocking strength-based tools for the past 30 years. And the Harvard Business Review has been saying for the past 10 years that what our young people and leaders such as yourself needs is emotional intelligence. We have the knowledge that proactively addresses airmen's problems. What we can do now is package them in a way that airmen can internalize. That is why my idea is to give them an interactive pathway to these skills through a choose-your-own-adventure video game. A video game would allow them to see these scenarios in a safe environment and on screen see choices they might not normally think of. They would get to see that their choices do have consequences and that tough times do pass. The ideal audience for this would be pre-accession recruits people excited to learn about the Air Force they've just joined. And we can see Choose Your Own Adventure still on streaming platforms, so we now know that while there is a vintage factor, it's still relevant. Next slide, please. The alpha version, named Branches, is currently being developed here in San Antonio. In it, the player goes through the storyline until they get to a scenario and make a choice. That choice opens up a new branch in the storyline towards a new topic and new education. While the alpha version only has a few topics, in the future we can add anything simply by putting in a new choice at a scenario juncture, leading to new options for education. Next slide, please. I have shown my proof of concept version to all walks of life. And the overwhelming feedback I received was that it was viable and addressed a need. From there, I went to leadership and subject matter experts across the joint force, looking for someone to tell me that my idea was dumb, so that way I didn't have to work on it anymore. Unfortunately, they have all loved it and given me their total support to continue working. Next slide. That is why I have built a team of subject matter experts to help us get the best tools and training after our airmen's number one topics. Next slide, please. While making the alpha version, I learned that while I have a lot of experience playing video games, I don't have as much experience writing them. That is why today I am asking for $150,000 to hire a video game content writer, someone who can take my team's knowledge, expertise, and passion and translate that into a compelling narrative accessible to our airmen. From there, we'll have a beta version, and we can use the other $150,000 for web hosting, allowing that beta version to be used by anyone that asks. From there, we will get large-scale feedback, An A1Z at the Pentagon, by policy, the owners of suicide prevention, have said they can take that data and then take this entire project under their larger umbrella. So today, choose your adventure. Be the ones that said yes to giving our future airmen better choices. I'm excited to see that future and to hear your questions. PJ, thanks so much. I appreciate Choose Your Own Adventure. I've always been a huge fan. I appreciate that though vintage may still be relevant, a huge uh, fan of that piece of this application. If you could talk to me a little bit about the 150K in development, it sounds like it's being presented as a one-time cost, but I imagine, imagine it'll continue to evolve and develop. Do you see future costs in development as well, or do you really feel like that 150 will get us where we need to go, and maybe there's an organic opportunity to, to change that in the future? What do you think? I think that while the money is going to definitely get us set up, it's going to depend on you and leaders such as yourself on what content we add, because we will need to hire more writers to expand that content. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great question.
TJ, I have a question. Great job, by the way. I love your energy uh, behind uh, your whole idea. Um, you've targeted um, the early accession, so young airmen and guardians. What about us? Uh, what about the leaders? Um, vintage. Uh, Vintage. What about us vintage people um, that this problem doesn't escape us as well? What are your thoughts? Have, what have you thought about that? I am so excited you asked that question, ma'am, because what you're describing is my, my 100 meter target. My long term goals is for this to then move up to ROTC, let's say, and then finally to leadership to be able to have the same language as our young uh, airmen as well. I would love us all to be speaking that same strength based language. Can you talk? Can you talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> how you incentivize? What, what's the What's the thought for, um, you know, hey, you know, go do the video game? I can imagine a couple things. One is you, you know, it's required, uh, which has its benefits and drawbacks. And one is that you just invite people to it. In which case, it's got to offer something. You know, it's probably not going to be flying dragons and stuff. I maybe it will be. But can you talk a little bit about the incentives that will encourage people to go? Because part part of it must be. You have to have an open mind to step into this and, and then choose the adventure and learn from it. That's an amazing question. I'm so glad you asked it because that was probably the number one reason why I thought our pre-accession recruits would be the easiest incentive. From there, probably the best uh, idea I've been given is that at the end, if you've unlocked enough endings, you get some kind of certification, something that then they can show their leaders, something they can put on as an EPR bullet. So you, you thought the you think the incentive for the new accessions? What is the incentive? Is it hey, if you want to put your paperwork in, you got to go do this. So that's the incentive, or is there something more like? What are your thoughts around it? I understand now. Yeah. Yes, that that is my in general thought process. Not that it's required, purely optional, but their excitement to see the Air Force, to experience the Air Force, to get a leg up, and maybe even have some of those tools going into BMT, which is, let's be honest, a stressful situation and they would want to have that leg up over their peers. Thank you. Chapu, <clears throat> uh, first off, I want to acknowledge your passion. It, it's very obvious that you care a lot about this program. Uh, so do we, trust me. Uh, you've, you've asked for 300K. What's your baseline for determining what your costs were? And talk a little bit, if you don't mind, about sustainment costs. I'm so excited to answer that question because I was able to get that through this process that part of the Innovation Rodeo, they connected us with the Resource Management Branch, and through them we did a preliminary analysis, and they did so much work for me that I had no basis on how to find those numbers, and they did, they went after it, and they gave me those numbers. Okay, and uh, have you thought about the sustainment piece at all? The sustainment piece, yes, that if we, their projected analysis would be that 150,000 uh, every year just for the web hosting. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Chaplain, uh, great job, job, I'm sorry, um, a lot of passion. Will that tail end cost or the sustainment cost go up as we start going from accessions to from the enlisted to the ROTC to and then into the actual active duty members, Garden Reserve, will that go up potentially? Ooh, Chief, that's a great question. I'm sorry, I will get you that answer. Thank you. Chaplain, I think you did a great job. This is a big problem. It's a nationwide problem, quite frankly. And so I'm curious on a two-part thing. One, when you say the folks you spoke to for feedback and survey were interested, right, they wanted, since they didn't have a game to prototype, explain how you sold it. Was it a, hey, I'm going to make this game, you'd love to play it? And then secondly, how are, are you able to partner with industry, universities, the colleges that you've been working with for both the students, maybe even veterans long term, because we've got a problem there. And how do you see that tying in? So two parts there. Amazing questions. The first one, I'm going to brag a little bit that actually what I did was I built a preliminary game purely in PowerPoint, but they got to click a button, they got to go through a plot line, they got to see a story, and they got to see different endings. So they, I was told that they got a fairly full view on what I was looking for. As far as the second question, I've been networking, I've been looking for all those kinds of answers. And I'm excited for this process. I think it's going to allow my information to get out there and I can connect to a lot more people in universities, in civilian sectors, to be able to get the best content. And I would offer to, don't limit it to that. 
federal agencies, I just came from another federal agency, and they're struggling with the very same scourge that the DOD does. And sometimes we think about this as a service-related thing or a DOD, but you can, you can imagine it's a problem everywhere. So other federal agencies may be doing something like this, too, or considering it. Um, so cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, sir. PJ, thanks so much for your passion, as you've heard from the judges today. They may not know that you actually found out about the Innovation Rodeo because of your passion and your persi persi persistence. You were knocking down doors. You're like, who can help me? Who's here for me? And it's really what brought you here today, and it resonates in your story and in your pitch. Thanks for all your hard work that brought you here today. Thank you, and thank you all very much. All right, judges, two down. I don't know how we're going to get through six more. That's a hard decision to make after pitches like that. Don't you agree? They are good. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, well, let's check and see what's going on with the rest of the pitch teams in the back. Jason, can you share us what's going on back there? Okay, so we are back here backstage at Techport Center and Arena in Port San Antonio. We've got our first two pitches are down. We've got our next teams ready to go right behind this door as we continue Innovation Rodeo 2022. So let's let's head on in and check on them and see how they're doing here. All right, here we go. We are uh, in here with Craig Rednauer and Lieutenant Colonel Adam Wally Wallace. Craig, how you feeling? Feeling good. Ready to go. Okay. Do you feel prepared having been coached all week? Do you, are, are you feel prepared for this uh, to go pitch to the judges? I do. I feel they have us in a good place. Okay, excellent. Anybody uh, watching the live stream you want to give a shout out to or say hi to? Just all the civil engineering squadron back home. All right. All right. CE, okay. Wally, how are we feeling? Fantastic, sir. Okay. You feel prepared? You got butterflies at all? Extremely thorough. Okay. Extremely. All right. A lot of, lot of energy. You ready? Oh, yeah. Too much Red Bull in there. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen you pounding the Red Bull during rehearsal. So, uh, all right. Here we go. Okay. Judges, I think that Craig is ready to come pitch. What do you think, J.D.? We would love to see our civil engineer friend, Craig. Bring him out. It's a beautiful day in the South Pacific. You're stationed at a forward operating base tasked with maintaining the airfield. As you go about your daily routine, suddenly, alarm sound. The base is under attack. After all the smoke clears, everyone rushes to the airfield to find the airmen that were out completing their daily duties. After the last medevac leaves, you ask yourself, what can we do better? What can we do to have less airmen in harm's way? And the answer is autonomy. Autonomous vehicles reduce the number of airmen required to complete their tasks, such as sweeping FOD, removing snow, mowing, and other daily routines. This, these tasks can be completed with a single airman operating multiple pieces of equipment. Slide. Every day we deal with multiple issues on the airfield, from FOD to bird aircraft strike hazard to simple human error. No longer will taxiway lights be hit because they were under snow and could not be seen. The precision guidance of our GPS system assures us that objects can be avoided even if they can't be seen. The same technology allows us to operate at off-peak hours and even at night. By installing this technology on standard equipment, we're able to utilize this equipment without the GPS guidance in manual mode should the need arise. Slide. Through the first round of testing, we have proven that autonomous vehicles are both safe and accepted. We have developed equipment that follows a pinpoint GPS path based both on our current GIS information system as well as a path that can be developed by an operator. We're able to detect and avoid new obstacles such as animals or sinkholes as they arise. We're also able to perform emergency maneuvers such as exit a controlled area movement, and then resume tasks once the emergency is cleared. All of this is done with varying less than three inches from the original intended path. Slide. 
Through the first five phases of testing, we had zero instances where the equipment did not operate as it was intended. After every phase, we received a comprehensive report on the results of that testing. During the final phase, we even had a civil engineering airman operate the equipment on the airfield. Slide, please. Several civil engineering squadrons and multiple other organizations have reached out to us to gain more information on our research. Some have even traveled to our base to view it for themselves. Slide, please. There was a time not long ago where the thought of an unmanned aircraft was simply absurd. Today, it's commonplace. In today's Air Force, time is a valuable commodity for the airmen. Autonomous vehicles give the airmen more time to complete complex duties, as well as keep them out of harm's way. Our research shows a $1.2 million return on investment in the first five years by installing this technology on our existing equipment. Today, I'm here to ask for $1 million for continued research and development. This would include three autonomous vehicles at two base locations to be put into daily operations giving you an immediate return on your investment. Thank you. Questions? Craig, thanks so much. I'll open it up to the panel to see if anybody has any questions. I, I think I have a question. It's, it might be a little complicated. I'm trying to understand it, right? So 1.2 mil for six vehicles, two bases, right? Is that going to be multiplied? Let's say the Air Force adopts this, right? Correct. So is that going to be multiplied times X amount of bases, and it's taken us five years to get the return on investment? So is that 1.2 mil just initial because of all the testing that's increasing the cost? Or is that literally what's going to cost us for every six vehicles moving forward? That's a great question. That would be the initial cost, and that is the 1.2 mil return on investment is based on putting it on existing equipment. And yes, that would be a per base return on that same time frame. Thank you. Yes. It's return, not cost. That's correct. All right. That is correct. That makes sense. Yeah, so, so it's not the cost. Industry utilizing uh, autonomy to the extent that uh, you got a perspective of its utility for what you've proposed, or are you on the leading edge uh, of the autonomy use along the applications that you've discussed? Right now, I feel we're on the leading edge. We've reached out to the FAA and other governing authorities, and right now, no one is putting autonomy on the airfield that we're aware of. Um, so we're kind of trying to blaze the way and open up a path for that. I have a question, uh, Craig. What's the training tale that goes to this so that not only the person operating distantly the, the vehicle, but also leadership and comfort and all of that, so the human side? That's a great question. Um, the vehicle itself is very easy to operate and can be done from a standard app or a laptop computer. Um, this is, it's very easy to train. It's a user-friendly interface, uh, very easy and it can be taught on multiple levels and you can have multiple devices that you would turn on and activate for different levels of leadership to be able to control these vehicles. There's a, there's a piece of me that would think that uh, autonomous vehicles off the airfield would be easier than on the airfield. Have you looked at that? I mean, you talk about flight is that pretty much strictly on the airfield or have you looked at, you know, um, outside the flight line? We have looked at both. Um, the equipment and technology that we're testing is larger scale equipment. So it's meant for more airfield, bigger areas that you may need. Um, we're pulling a 15 foot bat wing mower at the time behind it. Uh, we have looked into other technology to do the parade field and things like that where this equipment is just too big. Craig, can you talk to me a little bit about the tech and what it is that you're actually testing and what results would be successful for you? What would, what would you call success? A success would be going out after we prescribe our path and having this equipment go out and do it flawlessly. Uh, if the emergency comes in, we would perform our exit CMA maneuver and then be able to restart and go right back out where we were with no instances. And to date, we've been very successful. Let me just make sure I want, understand one part. I love your idea. I think it's great. Um, I'm impressed that you've already gotten it through so many testing phases. 
as you look at the education piece, the training piece, and at each installation, how does that all come together? I'm sorry, I had trouble here. How, how, does, how does the education, the training, and the finances all come together at the installation? Help me understand if that's a uh, installation bill or if this, once it's funded at the enterprise level, the wings, the installations will receive the support and ability to do it while I understand on the flight line, potentially in other areas, grass, snow, right. LRS capabilities and warehouses. I mean, I see a lot of functionality in this across the Air Force and savings. I'm just trying to figure out how it applies at the installation level, what that support would look like. Sure, the, the installation for the equipment and the technology itself would be part of the contractual package okay. for the equipment on the tractor or, or the piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, the funding itself, I know equipment is funded through CE Enterprises, so if we're retrofitting that, we would still be purchasing standard off-the-shelf equipment that is usually bought by a larger contract for our civil engineering squadrons. And then we can retrofit that equipment onto whatever is decided to be purchased by the Air Force. And who's gonna maintain the software that drives that? That would be through a contract that okay. is okay. through the okay. manufacturer. Thank you, good yes. job. How difficult is it to pull a, um, you know, one, of, one of the uh, packages off of one vehicle and apply it to another vehicle. Let's say you go from one type of tractor to another type of tractor. Is it reasonably easy to move from one to the other? It, it is. Uh, this technology, the company we've started working with, uses off-the-shelf act actuators and things that can be bought anywhere. Um, and the beauty of this program is it can be put on any size vehicle. Um, the parameters are then programmed into the computer system for the center line of the tractor, how wide, what piece of equipment you're towing, whether it be a sweeper, a mower, and then it translates that and knows to set up its path based on that. So it can be dismounted from one, put on another, and then reset the parameters in your program. Thank you. Okay. One last question, if I may. Sure. Uh, stage five, mm -hmm. what, what has been the biggest challenge? And what, is, is the money that's, that's keeping you from getting it across the line? or Because you're, you're quite along the way. Right. Right now it is the funding that's keeping us from moving forward. Um, in the very beginning, we had a lot of hurdles to jump, getting people comfortable with the idea of autonomous vehicles on the airfield. Uh, through our phases of testing, I feel we've achieved that. Thank you. Craig, thanks so much for your time and effort to bring you here. Again, we can see the passion come through in your idea, and what I love most about it is your intro, right? Talk about really making the mission, the rubber meeting the road, and how we can help our airmen, not only safety-wise, but uh, getting white space back into their lives. Really appreciate that part of your pitch to us today. Thanks for all you do, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much, I appreciate your time. Judges, judges, the name of this show is Innovation Rodeo 2022, and nothing to me says innovation like robot tractors, all right? <laughs> robot lawnmowers, I'm all about it. Listen, I got one of those little Roomba things at my house at vacuums, I got four dogs, and that is that, but on a huge scale. I absolutely love it. Colonel Ammons, what do you think? It. I love it because I think there's application in a lot of different areas to save time and money, and I, I love that he has taken it as far as he ca has so far. He looks like, I mean, he's, put, he's all in, he's gone, mm -hmm. he's done the homework, he's done the legwork. Colonel Sam's thoughts? Uh, I, I am, I'm struggling. Uh, every individual that stood here and the teams behind them is just compelling. Uh, this is going to be really hard, much harder than I honestly thought it was going to be. <laughs> it, Craig crushed it. It's tough. The three that I've heard have been fantastic. There's five to go. We're going to take a break, but before we do, we've got one more picture for the first half of Innovation Rodeo 2022, and that is Lieutenant Colonel Adam Wally Wallace. He's gonna come out and he is gonna pitch your faces off. And are we, are we ready? Let's see Wally, we wanna, we <laughs> wanna right. see Wally. Let's bring Wally out. October 2018, Tyndall Air Force Base. Not a fun place to be. I'm standing on the ramp and I'm looking across at the rubble that was once our squadron. The situation's surreal. It's just utter devastation. We have no power. We have no water. Cell phones? 
quit working two days ago. Internet connectivity? No way. What do you do? Now, what if in this situation I were able to pull out my cell phone and by simply swapping over to a Wi Fi network, I was able to communicate with my team instantaneously? Whether via text message, I can upload pictures, upload video, or I can see where everybody is at over a sleek user interface. This is what our team is doing. Slide, please. We have built a rapidly deployable alternate network. The ultimate goal of this is to bolster pace planning. We got the primary down, we got the emergency down, but are we giving enough love to the alternate and contingency portions here? You know, we had a network engineer, an Air Force network engineer, mind you, once tell us that we don't see the merits in your project. Our network never goes down. That terrifies me. <laughs> so we're here to give commanders the ability to continue to fight the installation when we lose it all. Slide, please. So what's the need? This isn't my opinion. This is rooted in joint publications, doctrine, and just common sense. You don't put one generator on a C-130. You put four. You fail over. So in this case, you know, you look at agile combat employment. The doctrine states right there. You need a communications network that is mobile, secure, survivable, and sustainable. LMRs and entry communication kits only go so far. To generate missions, you have to move data. Not just data to our senior leaders, but to everyone in that area. Additionally, what really shocked me was Joint Publication 3-12, Cyberspace Ops. It says, we often discount our reliance on these networks. Therefore, I quote, resiliency is essential. So the current push, right now, we got all the folks in the right room, we got the hardware, we built an MVP, we have a six node mesh that we built, and it's awesome. We're trying to take this from a TRL-6, from a bench, out into the field. And that's our next goal here, is to get this field in our next flyaway exercise to show its worth. Slide, please. So the solution, or let's go with the, the problem here first. The problem here is that contingency comms kits, they may not do what you want them to do. It may not, everybody may not even have them. They're infrastructure dependent. You gotta feed this thing. You have to have a generator set out here. You may need uh, legacy copper fiber lines to feed it. And then the cost, oh, the cost is what got us when here we were doing our market research. Those little briefcases that the journals carry around, they're awesome, but they come with a six figure price tag. You can't give that to a PLL troop out on the line. Just simply not doable. So the solution here is to come up with something that's self-sustaining, it's affordable, it's also secure. Think of something that deploys a level of encryption that's superior to what we have now, and is NSA certified, by the way. And finally, I think the most important part here is that it's universal. That allows everybody on the installation to play when we do lose it all. Slide, please. So what does this look like? In its simplest terms, this is what we've built. It consists of four components. The first is a solar-powered mesh node, Wi-Fi 6. Within that little chassis there, we call it a bank teller tube on the back of a solar panel, right? Is essentially a seven day battery life. Customizable radios that can serve up to 500 users. Pretty neat. The second part of that are what we're calling the microservers. Within that same tube, we're able to embed single board computers and distribute uh, capabilities throughout an entire installation. So think about this. You could have a rocket chat, Mattermost, chat client of your flavor wherever you want over here. You could be running an ATAC server over here. You lose one node, you still have functionality across the base. The third part is the encryption piece. We partnered with another startup out of St. Louis that is providing hardware-based encryption, not software-based, that is quantum resistant, future-proof. The fourth part is backhaul. Let's say those commercial ISP and cellular providers come back online. You wanna connect this back to the world while your infrastructure is still degraded? You can do that. Additionally, you can take commercial SATCOM and plug this in to provide that connectivity. Slide. So what's the ask? It's a half a million dollars. We wanna take all of the smart people, throw them in the same room, throw spears at this. We wanna expand the footprint of our MVP. We wanna field this on a larger scale out there. We wanna get it tested. We know it's gonna to have to go through Tempest. We know AFNIC's gonna to have to look at it. 
Let them tear it apart. And then finally, the most important part is for your advocacy to stand on some people's desks, to move those timelines from years down to months so we can bolster these pace plans and keep our team ready for the next fight. That being said, please throw your spears. Thanks so much, Wally. We really appreciate it. Open it up to the judges for questions. I'll start with a tactical question. So if you have a situation like a Tyndall and you have people come TDY to support, is it easy to get them plugged into it? You mentioned that, you know, hey, everybody at the base can come and do this thing. You find there's a lot of, a lot of times people come from out of town. Is it easy enough to get them tied into the, the same network? Yes, sir. Uh, it's a great question because the paradigm here is that you're going to have some administrators, essentially, for this network. You're going to have to go create username, passwords, certificate pairs, et cetera. So yes, you'll have to jump through some security hoops, but you can add people. Now those are already there. You can have them pre-vetted, pre-loaded, ready to rock and roll. Thanks. I got a, I got a quick question. So I, I see the cost dollar-wise, but now we're talking manpower. Uh, how, how we thought what that would look like, uh, what, what, the, <laughs> what the cost would be of, of manpowers. Uh, as far as uh, sustaining the system, there. Uh, so, Chief, with this one, the comm squadron about chased me out of the room with pitchforks. <laughs> They're like, who's going to sustain this, right? Who's going to be replacing these nodes? And I won't really reveal a dollar amount here, but they're essentially cheap enough that if one goes down, you simply replace it with another node. And it is a very, very, it's about a 10-minute setup per node that I can actually train airmen, the multi-capable airmen concept here within the unit, to do it in a matter of minutes. So... So that's for that, but what about the management of the admin piece of it, adding the users that come in TDY and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a, that would have to be a determined by the commander, but we can get back to you on a, on a better plan with that one. Wally, I want to build on Chief's question. Uh, how, um, have you thought about the, the enduring, right? This is for contingency. It's off the shelf, ready to go. Um, what if it's not needed for five years or six years? Technology seems to be changing so quickly, um, mm -hmm. as well as what's required, uh, what the rules and regulations are to keep it secure. Can you tell us about that? It's been one of those things you're just going to have to stay up with it. Um, it's, once we get that initial blessing, they're gonna, they may go in storage, just like you said. And right, the threats will emerge and we'll have to adapt with that firmware. So that's something that's going to have to be taken into account with the companies, the firmware updates as we receive those threats will have to be an ongoing thing, just like with any other system. Yes, ma'am. Adam, uh, we all know that <clears throat> industry is uh, designed to a large part to make money. Uh, are you before us indicating that uh, industry doesn't have uh, the technology of this nature? Uh, and why, why wouldn't we just go out and lease it when needed on a contractual basis to be provided on an as-need basis? So two parts. So if we are reactive with the leasing, I, I, I would argue that that injects additional timeline. So you're, you're expanding the timeline. The whole point of this is to have them on standby, ready to go, because we don't know what's coming next. We don't want to be taken off guard. I want my network back up within hours, not weeks after I'm hit with a crisis. Whether it's standoff weapons striking a forward operating base or another hurricane, and just Lieutenant Colonel Wallace here saying, I want it there. Yes, sir. Can I piggyback on his question for a minute? Is this something FEMA, Department of Homeland Security, or any of those folks already have created that we could grow? <laughs> I am aware of one, uh -huh. Kit Ma'am. Uh -huh. There is something that uh, essentially ties in mil comms with civilian comms, but it doesn't offer um, the level of fidelity that we're looking to, like, to move the data efficiently. So if you want comms, that's great but I think that's a, a little bit different operating system here. Okay. Well, I have a stakeholder question on both sides of this. So you said part of your ask is so you can bring a whole bunch of smart people into a room. I'd love to hear a little bit more about who you think those smart people are. And then on the advocacy side, so who is it within the department that you'd feel uh, we would need to rally around to help get you where you need to be with this project? So whatever avenue we're gonna go towards that authority to test and eventually lead to that ATO, whether that's the DDS or putting pressure on AFNIC or, or whoever, um, that's still to be determined, but that's where, that's where we're asking. How about the smart people in the room? Who do you think the smart people in the room is to help get this technology across the finish line? Who do you think that is? I want to expand really the view across industry, and of course, and then getting all the people that can, I want all the no people that can actually stop this, that can you know, put a break on this, to be in that room and just try to qualm those fears. 
So. Interesting approach, right? Let's go about it for the smart people who can help us problem solve, but then at the same time collaborate with those folks that we think might be a barrier to get us where we need to go. Correct. The earliest we can tackle that, the better. Awesome. Anybody else? All right, Wally, thanks so much. We really appreciate all you do. Um, see the passion, love the story, uh, got us with the application from, from the start. So thanks for all that you do. We really appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Judges, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> What's the You get it? Yeah, there we go. Hey, it was a joke. <laughs> What's the first thing you break down in combat, Mr. Jolivet? Uh, potentially my calm. Potentially your calm, right? That we, that's what we say. The radios go out first thing. It sounds like Wally's got a great innovative idea to potentially fix that problem. What did you think of that pitch, Mr. J? I loved it. Uh, again, it's been said, the, the thought that's been put into what's being presented to us today and how it can help us as, to help our warfighters uh, as a IAFIMSC responsibility, uh, I'm impressed. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I've already decided that uh, we've got eight winners and uh, <laughs> just don't know what to do. Yeah. Mark, well, we've heard four, so we've got four more to go. Chief, any last thoughts on that pitch? Oh, absolutely amazing so far. You know, when you think about uh, Chief Master of the Air Force's priorities, powering innovation all day long, that's what they've been showing us today. So super impressed. So we're excited, JD. We're, we're going to take a little bit of a break. What, what, did, what do you think about the first four pitches? So to me, this still comes back to culture, right? So we've got individual presenters with individual problems and individual solutions, which I absolutely love the time and effort spent. But what I actually love most is watching these teammates come forward and know that they've got a group of senior leaders and even more so in live streaming that got their backs and are empowered and impressed and look forward to just carrying it forward back to their installations. Just that ripple effect has really got me excited. It's, it's got everybody excited. The buzz is, is, is happening backstage. We still have four more presenters to go today. We're going to let you guys stretch your legs a little bit uh, and, and, and take a knee and hydrate. Uh, but before we do, to show that this isn't just talk, right? Innovation Rodeo is not just about doing this big production. Like whoever gets the, the, the win, whoever wins the gold belt buckle from Innovation Rodeo, their, 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 their thoughts become a reality. Their idea becomes a real thing. And we're going to rewind the clock two years and go back to Innovation Rodeo 2020, Major Jackie Vasta. And we're going to take a look at her, her idea that is now a real functioning thing, helping service members balance that, that life of service and family. Let's take a look at the video. Hi, my name is Jackie Vasta. I'm a major in the Air Force. I'm a force support officer. I'm a dual military spouse. But my most important duty title is mom. I'm so sorry, my phone is blowing up with call me ASAP texts. I would never do this. Rob, what's going on? Are Bobby and Charlotte okay? I'm in the middle of my pitch. You're getting deployed to Afghanistan? When? May, high squadron officer school in May. What are we gonna do about childcare? I can try to bring them with me, but remember what happened last time? Facebook, it just didn't work out. You know, we'll figure this out. I'll call you back, okay? All right, thanks. I'm so sorry, I'm so stressed out. Rob says hi, by the way. <laughs> Can I reset? Leaders, the phone call you just witnessed happens in the lives of countless airmen every day, and it happened to me. Military families need access to temporary childcare. Let me further explain the problem. Our workforce is changing. We have more women serving in the active component, up from 2.5% in the 70s to nearly 20% today. We have twice as many dual military spouses with children and single parents serving than we did in 1985. We have service members listing childcare as one of their top five stressors related to military life. Families need access to childcare. The main avenues that airmen are seeking to get childcare is through Facebook. The Air Force allows us to sublease our childcare spots. As you'll see in these posts, there's confusion surrounding this CDC policy. There's airmen who are posting their private information like TDY dates and deployment dates in a public forum. We also have confusion with the price, and this is where it gets tricky. To break it down, child care fees are based on total family income. So what I pay as a major is a higher rate than what a staff sergeant would pay. If I'm gonna sublease my spot to a staff sergeant, I'm gonna have to ask for a higher rate. Or maybe I can negotiate the price. Or maybe there's a bidding war for the slot. 
or maybe there's potential for price gouging for airmen. It's not working and it's not safe. I knew there had to be a better way and that's when Kinderspot was born. Kinderspot is a one-stop shop mobile app designed for parents of children enrolled in the Child Development Center to advertise, match, and sublease their spots with other eligible families with short-term childcare needs. Think Airbnb for childcare. All you have to do is register for the app and create a, a profile that will also capture your children's ages to make sure we get them in the right classrooms. And then you're going to search for care, enter your TDY location, or even your home station if you want to sublease your spot while you're on leave. Put in your how many child spots do you need, and then search. For Colorado Springs, we have four installations of child development centers. I'm going to go ahead and select on the Air Force Academy because they have seven kinder spots available. This is going to take me to a page where I can connect with the child development center and also take care of the payment all within the app. The payment is simply going to pause the owner spot and then charge the renter their appropriate amount based on their total family income bracket. The best part about Kinder Spot is that this is a joint solution. Child development centers are treated as a combined resource. There are 628 child development centers across the world that this whole market will be open up to. If you're a stay-at-home mom who needs a break from the kids to get some errands done, check out Kinder Spot. If your reserve is coming on orders, you need to bring your kids, go to Kinderspot. All military members on one network, that's Kinderspot. In the last four months, I've gained a tremendous amount of momentum with Kinderspot with the uh, ability to pitch this idea at the Force Support Squadron Leadership Workshop, where I got the buy-in from several Force Support Squadron commanders who own and operate the Child Development Centers with their excitement to beta test this app at their CDCs. I also had the opportunity to pitch this idea in a congressional caucus that was hosted by Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan, a former Air Force member who separated the service because of childcare issues, and that was 25 years ago. We can do better. The key stakeholders in this initiative have been Colonel Donna Turner, the commander of the Air Force Services Center, who has pledged her commitment to help propel this idea forward. I'm also going to need the support from Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, who, is, who has as recently as last week announced his commitment to making sure that we can have access and affordable childcare to all military families in his FY21 budget rollout. My ask is for $260,000. $10,000 to be dedicated to research and development to remove any barriers that are in place and $250,000 to develop a minimum viable product that we can prototype and test at Air Force installations. I also need your help. I need senior leader advocacy to bring this idea forward up the chain of command to the Department of Defense to make Kinder Spot truly the care we can share. I'd love to hear your questions. Hey, Jackie, thanks. First, congrats on putting on major. Thank you. Huh? Right? That was just like in the last week, wasn't it? My first week as major. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, you're knocking it out of the ballpark, already taking care of our airmen and mm -hmm. families. I love this idea. Um, you know, we've talked about it several times. What do you think are some of those barriers or whatever that we'll have to work or challenges or, you know, that we'll have to tackle moving it from obviously you know, the civilian sector onto the military sector, you know, in a highly governed structure CDC program. Thank you for your question. I, I know that we are going to have to, the first barrier would have to be putting this in policy. The CDC policy for subleasing, I'm so glad we have the ability to do it, but we need to regulate it. We need to make sure that airmen aren't paying each other directly because that's opening up everyone for vulnerabilities and liabilities and it's, it's, not, it's not working. As far as um, getting like the software developed to get this in the hands of everyone in the military and make sure that our private information is protected, um, the vision would be to have this kinder spot eventually linked to militarychildcare.com, which is a central portal that all military families already use just to get on the wait list. It's, it's completely compatible with the idea I am building, and that would, that would really be the best way to make it available to everyone. And then the app would be developed based on that policy. We'd have to tweak the app. The payment would, because so you're not raising it back and forth, so that app would then match the policy and tag in the military child care. Yes, sir. And, and DOD policy, okay. right? Okay. So we all can, all services can okay. use it. 
Super. So Jackie, you said um, the, now they use Facebook. Um, how long did the Facebook word of mouth kind of get spread and kind of go down on that trail yeah. versus how, how fast do you think or predict that we could do with the marketing so that folks will be able to use the, the new app that you're proposing? Right, the biggest, the biggest problem other than they've been paying each other on Facebook is that you don't know what group to join. You don't know how to tap into that market to match needs and requirements. So getting it on militarychildcare.com will essentially mandate that we use militarychildcare.com as a subleasing module to connect to Kinderspot. So the marketing is really in place. We just need to make sure that we can test the app by word of mouth. And I'll tell you, I've gotten a lot of um, positive feedback within um, you know, the local women's Facebook forums, you know, excited to try this. So I mean, I think it's spreading, but um, eventually be mandated to, to get to use it. Today. Chief, that was absolutely phenomenal. Let me tell you, we had, we just went through eight teams coming in professionally presenting their innovation idea to a panel of five judges that they didn't even know. I mean, it goes into the great aspects and the great airmen that we have in the Air Force every single day. But it's the end of the competition, right, Chief? It's good. So we're going to have to hand out a little uh, awards here uh, as we walk through our top three. So our number one innovator for the 2020 Innovation Rodeo is Major Jackie Basta with Kenner Spot. Come on out, Jackie. All right, Jackie, congratulations. How cool is that? I love your idea. I think it's going to be phenomenal things. Yeah, good job. All right, thanks, Jack. Yeah. Right, thank Tell Rob we said thanks too. And a new major just pinned on major. Congrats, Jackie. Yeah. Welcome back to Innovation Rodeo 2022, live streaming from the Techport Center and Arena in Port San Antonio, Texas. I'm Jason Seibel, your host from the Air Force Security Forces Center, Air Force IMSC, and uh, we've had four pitches. We've got four to go. The judges are ready. The next uh, two teams up are ready, or at least we think we are. They are. We're, we're right here outside their dressing room, and we're going to check on them right now. All right. Let's, uh, let's bring it in here, guys. We got Staff Sergeant Dylan Whitehead, Lieutenant Colonel Kyle Kramer, uh, the next uh, two teams up. Uh, Sergeant Whitehead, how you feeling? Good. All right. Uh, you feel confident? You feel ready to go give your pitch? Yes, sir. Very excited. A little nervous. A uh, little nervous, but a little, little butterflies are okay. Who do you want to give a shout out back to that's watching the live stream? Uh, just shout out to my wife, Megan, and my son, Trent. All right. He's uh, all the way, uh, where, where are you at him? R.E.F. Crowley. Oh, oh, all the way across the pond. Okay, uh, Colonel Kramer, how are yes. you feeling? I'm great. I'm ready to uh, present and uh, bring this week to an end. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how was the week? <laughs> what did you think of the, of the buildup and the prep? Uh, it was amazing. Uh, I said throughout the week, taking 17 years of military training and briefing styles and throwing that out the window and learning how to pitch, uh, which is an amazing experience. It's something that's kind of new to learn. Okay, yeah. well, I told the judges before the break that you guys were ready to pitch their face off. Right. Are you are you ready to go do that? <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Judges, are you ready to see Sergeant Dylan Whitehead? Jason, yes. let's see Dylan and Defender is on. Bring it on.
It's 1 a.m. on a Saturday night. Your kid wakes you up. They're having a hard time breathing. You want the best of the best to respond for your child. What if I told you that response was hindered because that defender, EMT, or firefighter had to stay for three hours after their previous 12-hour shift in order to get a new web belt? As a parent, how many of you guys are parents? That wouldn't make us feel very comfortable knowing the person aiding our children isn't on their A game due to a lack of sleep. What if this problem could be avoided by modernizing our supply section? Slide. The problem at hand is defenders work unorthodox shifts that could be as long as 12 to 14 hours and in patterns of four days on and two days off. This makes it extremely difficult to get with the supply section who work Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Security Forces Supply is also extremely task saturated. This leads to unknown wait times due to additional duties. On top of all of this, the Security Forces Warehouse is located separately from our main squadron. This makes the problem even harder because defenders not only have to get with their supply section, but they also have to convince them to go to the warehouse with them to get the gear they need. The solution to these problems that I came up with is a website called Defenders On. It's an Amazon-like experience that allows members to go online, order their gear, and have that gear dropped off in a smart locker for pickup. This not only gives time back to the defender to have a better work rest cycle, but also spend time with their family. This as well gives time back to the supply section to focus on their primary duties. Slide. The next step in modernizing our force will be the beta phase. During the beta phase, this will be ran at RAF Crowton, where all of the problems with the website can be figured out. At RAF Crowton, the delivery system will be the guard mount room. This will ensure each defender's gear is waiting for him upon arrival for duty. After the beta phase, we'll move into the scale phase, where the website will be transferred to a contracting team. In this phase, the contracting team will expand the website and roll it out to all the security forces. Slide. As you can see, this is my wonderful team. I have two awesome program managers behind me, as well as a group full of great stakeholders. Slide. Moving forward, I will create an account feature that will allow members to log in and input their sizes for all of their gear. This will allow the supply section to conserve money because now they will only order exactly the amount of gear they need rather than a mass amount of each size. This will also allow when a member is PCSing their gaining unit to go in and access their account, see exactly what gear they need in all the right sizes, get a go bag ready full of all of their gear, ultimately leading to a faster turnaround in processing. Now what I need from you, I'm asking for 300000 for the contracting team to scale the website as well as future senior leader support in obtaining any SIBRs. As a defender, I would do anything for three extra hours with my family. Can you guys help me stay on my A game? I'll open up for questions. Dylan, thanks so much. Super thanks powerful, man. super impactful, and I think you saw all of us raise our hands, so yeah. this resonates with all of us. Yes, I'll open up to the judges for questions. Well, Dylan, I'm going to start as a career sure. defender. I'm excited about what uh, you've introduced here, and I uh, want to say thanks, uh, thanks from sir. the bottom of my heart. Uh, my first question is, can I get a big hula from you? Hula? Oh, all right, all right, let's get to it. Um, you've modeled this off of uh, the Amazon process, and your cost factors uh, seem very reasonable for what you're asking and what it can provide. Where did those come from? So we reached out to subject matter experts in the field, and that was just a rough estimate. Those aren't exact numbers, sir. OK, very good. Again, thank you. Cool. Cool. Dylan, can I ask what you think this SIBR would accomplish? What, what would you hope out of a SIBR event? So the thing I see forward, there's two ways of moving it forward, and that would be, so at RF Crowton, I'm going to run it off the SharePoint, and this could be ran off of every, t every base of SharePoint, where the supply section would just get training and they would know how to run the website themselves, or the SIBR would accomplish uh, funding for the contracting team to maintain the website. Do you see the future continuing to be on SharePoint? Uh, that is one very good aspect, and that makes it free for moving forward. So nice job. Thanks, sir. Um, I'm thinking about the smart locker aspect of it, right? Yes, I know that's a little infrastructure thing that mm -hmm. you have to think about. I saw the picture. Not a lot of smart, smart lockers out there. But what's the vision? Do you, do you think smart lockers are, are a necessary adjunct to this 
or, or you know what I mean, can it be delivered without smart locker? Smart Good locker? question, sir. So no, Defender's Design is not dependent on smart lockers. Smart lockers would be a very safe and universal delivery system as they get rolled out base to base. But at RFCOM, we're gonna use the guard mount room. And another idea that was pitched was the base defense operations center. And anywhere that you need, like you could put it and each member can have access to that getting their gear. Gotcha, so you would have a, I go on Defender's Design, I say I need this bit of equipment and then it's in the guard mount room, which is a 24 seven. Yes, operation and you just hey you just got to switch out there or go there you're going to find your bag pick yeah. it up you're good yes, to sir. Go. all right thank you sir no problem dylan i have a comment uh, and then a question i forward thinking this was amazing uh, a great you. job forward thinking does defenders move from base to base and installation to installation for it to their information to travel uh that was great great forward thinking my question is who's delivering uh, who, who on whom is the delivery to wherever uh, the gear goes. Is it on the supply team? Is it where's that that uh, cost going to be? Yes, ma'am. So the supply okay. section would do that. So rather than have their day-to-day -day inter like interactions get interrupted by an airman coming in, like in the middle of their one of their work sessions and being like, "Hey, I need this. Can you help me get this?" They would set out a certain amount of time at the end of the day or like during lunch at, at the end of their lunch to just do that and get their orders ready for pickup. That makes sense. More predictable for them to more efficient. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. No problem. Sergeant Whitehead, great job. Tell me a little bit about, as you did the beta test, how did you determine the savings that are going to hopefully multiply at each phase? Tell me so about that. So we haven't ran the beta phase yet, ma'am. Oh, you have not. Um, but through our preliminary analysis, the time savings we came up with was through initial gear turn-in, or initial gear issue, gear turn-in, and then repeat visits. So we came up with, it's a 33% return on man hours, okay. going back to the supply section and airmen as well. Because you're doing it at your base, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, that's what I meant, thanks. Um, I think about Amazon, it's kind of like always going um, and updating. Mm -hmm. So I also then think, well, s well, Defenders probably have different gear at different times or you get new stuff come in. How does Def Defenders on like link to that? Is it is it a very clear linkage to be able to update so you're not ordering gear that's no longer? Yes, know, sir. So that would be on the supply section to go in and update once it moves out to the SharePoint. But as well as there's a feedback section on there. So say I had something at my previous assignment that they don't offer here, I could leave a message in their feedback section and then our supply section could order that. All right, thank you, sir. Yep. I think I just want to piggyback on your question. On, on your question. So this is said guard mount or you pick the building, right? So, mm -hmm. so we're not talking lockers, right? Not currently, sir, but right. when the smart locker gets rolled out, we'd like to pair it with that, yes, sir. Say that again? When the smart lockers get rolled out to each base, we'd like to pair it with okay, the smart Okay, so locker. the initial $300,000 does include some sort of a locker system? It does not, no, it sir. It does not? So is it just for the SharePoint? That would just be for the contract company to scale the website and have each supply section have their own website. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Bill, i got a follow-on. Yes, sir. Um, you've pointed this at the security forces community. What do you think the applicability is outside of that? I think this relates well to any shift workers and it take, gives them their time back. This could also be scaled to LRS. There would just have to be an accountability feature where you would sign for your stuff online rather than go in in person and sign for it. Thank you. Dylan, I just want to say thanks on behalf of AFIMSC, the judges here. We know this isn't your comfort zone, but you knocked it out of the park. Thank thanks you. for your passion and paying it forward. We know this essentially came out of your free time, your team, your partnership. Uh, super proud to know you and for all your hard work. Thank you. Congratulations. Good Defenders on revolutionizing the way the defenders can get their equipment. That was a fantastic pitch, and I love how uh, Dylan was able to, to combine another innovation, which is the smart lockers. Mr. Jolivet, as, as a career defender, what do you think? It has a host of opportunity and capability that we need. Uh, Dylan mentioned that there's an offset. The supply section currently has a responsibility. This will help them to do it better. Uh, and I, I took a moment while he was... Uh, speaking, I, I called the chief, and he's going to be reassigned to the center next week. So, <laughs> so good. Very, very quick. Colonel Ammons, uh, kind of a wider use of Defenders on to, to, to everybody else. I mean, do you, do you think that you can see that future there? Absolutely. Just coming out of MSG at a job where I can physically see the warehouse right now where LRS folks are working nonstop, turning stuff in and turning stuff out for deployers, defenders, all sorts of folks. I see that's applicable. What I really like, though, is is having a visual of a defender's 12-hour shift and then hearing the amount of time it's taking and the savings that you get on a guy who has a guy and gal who has to be on their A game all the time providing the security for an installation. So I think there's a lot of uh, 
intrinsic benefit that, that he speaks to as well as far as the work-life balance for folks as well. Well, I tell you, I might have a beard now and uh, a couple extra pounds more than I did a few years ago, but I was a defender working mid-shift at one point in time, and that, that time back to the family and that defender downtime, that's huge. J.D., we're, we're, we're in the second half. We're on the downhill slide. What do you think? So, again, I've, you've heard me say it, but I, can't, I don't really have anything else to add. What a great group. Uh, super competitive, very well thought out. The pitches are impressive. We have very junior airmen and guardian here just bring in their game. Can't be more excited about the things that they're offering from technology, uh, from processes, getting airmen their white spaces back, tech. I love it. I appreciate all the judges, the engagement. I think as a team, we'd agree. We're excited to see what's left. It's going to be a tough decision. Well, our next pitch up is Lieutenant Colonel Kyle Kramer. He is very excited. He's, he's, he's ready to go. He's backstage. What do you think? Let's see Kyle. All right, let's bring out Lieutenant Colonel Kyle Kramer. At the end of the day, what do you wish you had more of? Time. Time, exactly. It's finite and it's critical in the decision making process. Throughout my entire career, from acquisitions, operations, and now tests, we've always tried to find a way to cut down that decision making process and timeline. Be it from days down to hours to influence future tasking and missions or decades down to years and months to rapidly develop and deploy new capability. But also data, and specifically how we transport the data and the speed we, we share it is critical. Data is growing more and more every day. And what if I told you we could leverage our existing infrastructure, commercial hardware, and now share data at speeds 800 times faster than what we do today? I present to you the toll booth of the future. Just kidding. But <laughs> instead of talking about wavelength division multiplexing or optical transport networks, let's quickly talk about cars and highways. Cars is that data that we're trying to share. The highway is that infrastructure of how we transport that data. Every single day there are more and more cars trying to drive down that highway, causing delays and congestion. What if I told you we could build a toll booth, or a switch in this case, that can take 100 cars, merge them into one car, and send it down that highway? And then at that distant end, there's another toll booth that will split it out, and everybody goes on their way. And I've just now freed up that highway to move even more cars. Slide, please. The bottom line is, is we have to share data at speed. We have to be connected from mission partners to stakeholders to expedite that decision-making process so that we at least maintain but gain more advantage and superiority. Again, data is growing exponentially every day. To put that into perspective, the space shuttle, when it was developed, used 400,000 lines of code. The F-35 was developed with 23.5 million lines of code. Also, there are many units across the Air Force that either use or produce terabytes of data, if not more. And what that equates to is you trying to stream 170 two-hour-long HD movies simultaneously. We're quickly approaching petabytes if we haven't reached it already. That then equals 170,000 movies. Slide, please. So the problem is, at Eglin specifically, is that the infrastructure is excuse me, inadequate for next generation testing of systems. It only provides 10% of the capacity that we need. And also, the manual processes and the limitations that we face today cause us to rely on units to share what they can or able to, where we want to be in a position that we can go out and discover all that data, and I can pull anything and everything that I could possibly want. Luckily, the solution is commercial hardware that's extremely tailorable, highly reliable, mature, 
and that can provide a customer 10 gigabits per second all the way up to 800 gigabits, gigabits per second dedicated as they need it. This will transition us into an automated, almost near real-time capability of sharing data. And at Eglin, we're going to connect 18 organizations across 43 sites. This is easily scalable across other bases, match comms, and even services. Slide, please. So the need, our senior leadership talks every day. We have to be connected. We have to share information to maintain that superiority. But let me put it another way. We've developed aircraft that can fly at mock speed to deliver effects or support troops in contact. The same is true in the digital environment. We have to deliver data at mock speed. Luckily, the momentum is there and we don't have to recreate the wheel. This is an industry standard that is proven and used every day. We have a small team in place that's already made significant progress. The initial phase is already on contract and funded and will be complete by January 23. We're now in a second phase that will be on contract in September, but we do lack full funding for that. Slide, please. So this is, consists of a small team at Eglin Air Force Base of three units. It's a notable collaboration between the 45th Test Squadron, the 47th Cyberspace Test Squadron, as well as the 96th Comm Squadron. And of the six stakeholders you see up there that represent research, acquisitions, tests, and operations, NBE will impact and support three major commands. Slide, please. So I want to remind you that luckily our second effort will be on contract in September, and we can use both, use both O&M and RDT new funding, and we can incrementally fund this effort as the funds become available. So today, I'm asking for $539,000 to help conduct power modifications and hardware buy as needed. And please, help me move those cars down that highway at mock speed. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Kyle, thanks so much. We heard a little bit of behind the scenes of uh, prepping for this briefing and the expertise you have behind it and being able to make that in a language that's relatable to the rest of us. The toll booth and the cars was absolutely perfect. So congratulations <laughs> on being able to bring it down to a level where the civil engineer can understand it. So thank you very much for that. So I'll open it up to the judges if they have any questions. I, Chief, go ahead. I have a quick question. How secure is it? So luckily, this is independent agnostic of the security aspect. So that data, the communication, is already encrypted before it hits, hits those switches. This is purely the transport of that data. So the security will be in place, and we're not touching that. Yep. This is just moving data faster. Thank you. Yes. Kyle, well, I, I think you quick. did a, sorry, sorry, I apologize. I think you did a great job on your presentation and the amount of teaming that you have done already is pretty impressive and that you've already gone through the phases. I want to go to kind of a tactical question. Tell me how you determined that we were only meeting 10% capacity in our current business model. Um, so currently at Eglin Air Force Base, we have a 10 gigabit per second fiber optic network okay. there in place, um, but that is shared. So across... Eglin is a nine-wing equivalent with 36 units, and that turns into thousands of program offices from AFRL to the testing and acquisitions. So there was a, a government estimate of the current requirement and the future requirement with the expansion of Eglin Air Force Base of, of the capacity that's there. Okay, yes, ma'am. Kyle, this is exciting. It, Defender, it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the A6, uh, we, we saw your partnerships. Has the A6 got any visibility on this uh, unfolding at all from your, th that from your knowledge? Have you been in contact with them at uh, all? At the half A6 level, yes, sir? Yes, I'm sorry, half A6. Um, possibly. Uh, I would have to get back to you to confirm that. Okay. But uh, Eglin is, we, we saw a need there. Um, they started paving the way. Um, this has been, gotten attention at the Air Force Test Center um, to expand that across the test enterprise. And I, I would expect... I would have to assume, but uh, yes, sir, I, I would have to confirm with you yeah. how high that's, it's made it up well, the chain. Well, the only reason I ask is because this is that exciting, and I would hope that they, they would see it and want to help you along the path. So yes, thank sir. you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm struck. 
same kind of question I was saying, thinking about SAFCN. And you know, when it's something that seemed right, 100 to 1 sounds great. So then the question is, why doesn't the enterprise see 101, 100 to 1, and implement it de facto rather than have a Herculean effort to try to build it from the ground up? And that's, and I don't know if it's because, maybe it's because the technology is new enough and the bureaucracy is slow enough that we're, we, that, that doesn't quite mesh quite yet, or I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, yes, sir, so great question. Now, I wanna, my pitch is to highlight the technology is there, uh, but I would have to clarify that our initial effort is for non-core networks. So if you're aware, core networks is if you think of Nipper, Sipper, or our day-to-day -day network where we do our email. We are proving this out on the non-core uh, network we have in place, which is our defense, our development and research and engineering networks. In, in a lot of the networks that program offices, the labs that they use to push uh, that, that data, and we'll prove it out there. But again, this is a commercial hardware solution that you could, if you have an optical transport network in place, you can lay this hardware on there and achieve the same throughput. How long is, how old is the technology? Uh, I would have to confirm that, um, but it's, I think, relatively new within the past five years. Um, and is the model like, you know, defender, finance guy? <laughs> so is the model like, hey, yeah, I'm at a, I got my laptop and I got a how you doing on it and I get 100 to 1? Or is it something where it's like, nah, there's a, there's a hardware piece. We're thinking about, right, replacing switches, old 911 uh, switches type switches from the 90s, right? So we've got big telephone switches, and that's what I think about when I think about switches. Right. What does this look like? Is, is it like a little thing that's in a back room, or is it a room, or is it something that's, you know, connected to my laptop? Um, so if you go into your back, your back room comm closet, you'll see your rack with, with switches. It, it, it is to that level. It is not major infrastructure. Um, we're just plugging in new switches. Um, that would look no different than those, those older versions uh, that you see today. Thank you. Yes, sir. If it's available commercially, tell me a little bit more about the prototyping that's needed to make it effective at Eglin. Um, so, so luckily the prototyping, uh, it's been proven out in, in the commercial industry. The, so, excuse me, there's not much prototyping to be done. It's how we integrate that into our existing DOD uh, infrastructure and then showing that the speeds are there, and then the use cases of how all these organizations are able to share data in the real near-time impact that it can provide. And how many switches are we talking about, Kyle, for your test? Like, how many switches would your ask get you? Um, so for the second phase, it would be three sites, and we would install uh, about eight switches. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Anybody else? Again, Kyle, thanks so much. Really appreciate you, you being able to present this very technical presentation in a way that this uh, audience is able to understand and appreciate. We know a lot of hard work went into it, and we know you're supported by a great team at Eglin. Yes, thanks for all that you do. Super exciting. We look forward to hearing more about it. Right. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, judges, what do you think? You tallying up your scores? It's hard math for me to do, right? A lot of points going up and down. We're getting towards the end. What do you think? Well, I've said it before. Uh, any of them came out. This is uh, uh, a lot tougher than we might think sitting here judging. And for anybody listening in, uh, they've met previous tests. They're the best of this particular competition, and they're proving to us why. Uh, wow. Just wow is all I can say to it. It's great. I think for me, one of the things is... I'm not technically astute enough to know any of it. So it's like, well, that sounds pretty good, and it all sounds pretty good. And I guess what I'd want each of them to know, in fact, everybody who submitted, is that, you know, there's going to be th three. Mm -hmm. But the other five, there will still be venues to be able to pursue the ideas. And the other, whatever the number is, 60 whatever, um, there are still venues to be able to pursue the ideas. And not to, like, you know, I find... In, in my career, folks who don't take, you know, don't take no for an answer continue to pursue when they know it's the right thing to do, you can still get results. So this is just one step in the process, but uh, yeah, I'm struck by the fact that, uh, that um, each of them, uh, not only that, but also, also that each of them is kind of addressing a separate problem.
problem. I mean, this isn't like eight um, similar things. Uh, so I, anyway, that's what I found kind of interesting about it. Well, I'm looking forward to the last two. Should we see what's going on backstage? Jason, back to you. We are back uh, backstage here again at Tech Port Center and Arena in Port San Antonio, Texas. We've got two presenters left to go for Innovation Rodeo 2022. We're going to check on uh, Tech Sergeant Brian Trummett and Staff Sergeant Anthony Davis as they get ready to make the final two pitches of the afternoon. All right, here they are. They're ready to go. They're jumping to it. Tech Sergeant Trummett, how you feeling? Good, Jason. You're, you, you look nervous. You're, you're in your interview stance, man. You're ready to go. Ready to go. How, 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 does, uh, how do you feel that this week has been? Oh, it's been great. Great training, great training to get us pushed out there, ready to go. You feel like the, you know, you're ready to go pitch this thing? I sure hope so. All right. Sergeant Davis, come on up here. Come on up here. So uh, I, I came in and told you earlier, but I actually got a text from an old friend of mine watching from McDill. Uh, he's the, the SEL of innovations there, and he said good luck. So you got anybody else at, uh, back at McDill watching? Uh, my wife and uh, two dogs. Hi, how you doing? And my mom. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mom. It always works. Yeah. How you feel, Sergeant Davis? You you feel like you're prepared to go? You nervous? I am a little bit nervous, but hopefully the adrenaline will push me through. I, oh, I think it will. You got you got some great ideas and ready to innovate. Judges, the last two presenters are ready to go. What do you think? We want to see Brian. Let's bring him out. <laughs> Boom, incident happens, suspect takes off running. My partner and I look at each other and we take off after the suspect. Now I'm a lot bigger and faster than my partner, so after a minute, I lose him. Another minute goes by, here's something hit the ground. I can't look, can't stop, gotta get the suspect. Another minute goes by, catch up to the suspect, we go to the ground, I gain control. Reach for my radio, it's gone, it's a problem. Look around for my partner, partner's gone, it's a problem. Look down at the suspect, that's a problem. But let's talk about the real problem. Slide. Gear. Security forces carry on average 40 plus pounds of gear. Now that's your vest, your ammo, your weapons, and so on. We have a lot of required items that we have to carry. The smaller ones, your radios, non-lethals, cameras, flashlights. Now all that can add up to some smaller weight, but it still adds to your body, about 11 pounds. Now that adds stress over time. Your eight, 10, 12, 14 hour shifts. You're talking neck pain, shoulder issues, back pain, hips, knees. That's a problem. Now also, security forces want to be standardized. But security forces come in all shapes and sizes. I'm proof of that. Wouldn't it be great if you went for your radio and it was there? You didn't have to worry about losing your flashlight or even worse, misplacing your non-lethal capabilities. Good news, there is a solution. Slide. The wearable defender. One item conveniently located on the wearer's forearm that takes eight items into one. Reducing the overall weight from 11 pounds by 80% down to two pounds. Conveniently located right in front of the wearer. You have your comm equipment to where you can communicate and receive orders from BDOC. You have one patrol out in the field you need to talk to, you can send messages directly to that patrol. You have a message that you need to get across to everybody, send it to everybody. You have your non-lethal capability that you never have to worry about losing. You have a camera on here. If you have a gate runner, all you have to do, point and start recording. You can capture the license plate and it will automatically read and start running the license plate of the vehicle. You arrive at a crime scene, you don't want to mess anything up, so you start recording to preserve evidence as you find it where it is. Additionally, you no longer have to worry about your work-related injuries. Also with that, it has a two-fold manpower saving ability. Inside the armory for gear issue and turn-in. Also, it saves the defender time with accountability of all those items. 
It also saves your overall gear footprint inside your armory and other storage facilities. Slide. We have the right people in the right place at the right time to make this happen. Where I am the project champion with a great support team behind me. Our key stakeholders are willing and able to push this prototype out to the field for beta testing. Slide. That is where you all come in. With the initial ask of $250,000 to where we can get 80 of these units out to the field for further testing. Also, we're asking for senior leader endorsement for future SIBRs so we can further develop this technology to better suit and fit defender needs. Now think back to that chase. You reach for your radio, it's right here. You outrun your partner, it's all right. He can see you on the GPS and he will get to you and if he can't, BDOC will send additional patrols. Thank you for your time. I'll field any questions. Brian, thanks so much. The first uh, pitch with uh, show and tell. Can't beat it. So excited to hear a little bit more about it. Judges, any questions for Brian? Can you tell us a little bit about the battery life? So you're going to be wearing that for how long? What's the recharge? Yes, thank you. Great question. So the battery lasts around eight hours, depending on how much you use it, but it has a hot swappable battery capability. It has a what capability? Hot swappable battery. So old one out, new one in. Would the vision be to have it something that's deployable as well outside of you know standard U.S. based networks and all that yes. kind of stuff? Yes. In the in the future, that's where we would love to take it. And um, you know, I don't know what what defenders use right now. I mean, handhelds, Motorola radios, and stuff like that. Is there's you know upgrades, et cetera, et cetera? What's the thought on being able? Are these you know capabilities hardwired in here? Are they? plug and play or what's the what's the vision it would be hardwired into here it would be a one-stop shop everything's right here so um, updatable yes um, new system comes out new updates you just plug into a USB and update and go so as you said um, Brian um, defenders come in all shapes and sizes so will that device in the future come in all shapes shapes and sizes as to include a, a left-hand, right-hand option. Is that yes, it will. And, and it, right now, it's one solid piece, but it's going to be broken down with live hinges so it can wrench down and actually fit the wearer's arm better. Okay. But yes, it will. Thank you for your question. Brian, am I to understand that uh, the, the limited utility, uh, well, I shouldn't say utility, the limited numbers in the field today is due to the fact that this is new technology. We're on the front end of everything. Yes. Okay. So we want to get those initial 80 units out there for the initial testing so we can see eventually for the SIBR what works, what doesn't, what can we improve on it. Are we working with the LAPD for lessons learned so that we're not repeating some of the shortfalls that they've had? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, again, sustainment and cost. You, you're pretty comfortable that we can uh, afford this product because as in the past with cameras, uh, worn cameras, body-worn cameras and such, we discovered that uh, it just costed us out. It was just too costly for us to implement. Yes, so right now we are only $10,000 over the status quo with this as the new system. And was there a drawdown cost by integrating all those different phenomenologies that can show some type of savings or was it more expensive or uh, have you done that type of long-term financial I have not, but I can do it and get back to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That should be part of your pitch. You save funds by not by the eight, ten pieces of equipment that you have embedded in there. You're now no longer purchasing through the supply equipment. So that's a good storyline that you can tell. Yeah. Thank you. F functionality. Obviously, you're used to having the radio, having the, the, the camera, the flashlight. Have you spent a lot of time with it to see how functional it is on a on a on a when you're grappling with somebody or when you're chasing somebody, uh, having to, you're right-handed, right? Uh, I'm yes. assuming. So now you have to do multiple things while you're holding a gun to try and turn flashlight, do my calls, or is it an a, uh, audio thing that I can just activate with voice? So it's not quite to the audio thing to activate things. You will have to reach over and use your other hand if need be. There are some smaller things. There's buttons here to turn the, the flashlight on and off. Uh, but you will have to reach over. And you said ease of movement. Reaching for a button, it's so the same. same. Copy. Just instead of reaching here or down here, you just got to get used to reaching over to your other arm. 
got me. Thank you. Thank you. You want to test it on the chief? Grapple with the chief. <laughs> 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 Sign the waiver. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about uh, LAPD and stuff. You know, there's a different tech, different means to an end. Right, one would be follow them and purchase whatever comes out of their, you know, um, test and evaluation and all that kind of stuff. Any thoughts along those lines? It would be good to be able to follow what they do. If they have a good final version and it works and we can purchase it, then why not? But if we can customize it to suit our needs, because our needs are very different than the LAPD, then I think that would be also be a great option. Leads me to a competition question. Is yes, it the same vendor for LAPD and us, or are there multiple vendors out there who are working in this space? Do you know anything about that you could share? Right now, to my knowledge, there's only one vendor that makes an all encompassing product. There are vendors that make uh, a tablet like device or non lethals, but to have an all encompassing device, there's only one vendor that I know of. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Ryan, thanks so much. The hard work that you put in this week, it really shows. Love the support of the team and the innovation. Really great job. Just want to applaud you and your effort to bringing you here, here to the stage today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Judges, I just want to tell you that a wise person once told me, don't dress for the job you have, dress for the job you want, and I want to be Batman. I want to have that thing on my wrist to be able to, to do flashlights and lasers and, and tasers and, and all of that stuff. What an outstanding pitch. JD, what would you think? So I agree to show and tell, and my family is also a fan of Batman taking us into the future. I love the tech aspect of it. It's what you often are excited to see about Innovation Radio, not taking away from the other teams and you know, maybe a little process oriented, maybe not as far along in the, in the process to be able to have a prototype to bring with us. I also love that he's partnering, engaging with LAPD, that really reaching outside of our normal network just shows a lot of passion and due diligence to bring us a technology that is, is very scalable and, and very much a reality now. So super exciting. So this is something we like to see, right? Is reaching outside and finding, you know, like in, 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 the, in the world and, and, and looking what they're innovating that we can, we can translate to that Air Force. And like you said, with the LAPD and LA County Sheriffs and having that. Uh, Mr. J, we're going to defer back to you as the, as the panel defender. What would you think? Well, um, I think I'll defer to what she said. I can't say it any better. Everything that uh, was said kind of sums up where we are. This will put us out front and not behind or at, on even step width. I think we can introduce it to the rest of our brothers and sisters, both within the DOD and outside. And uh, it's time for us to get ahead of the fight as opposed to walking along with it. And honestly, uh, I, I looked at it. It looks like it's ruggedized. This is going to be something of great interest to the career field, and I think it's going to help us tremendously. I like hearing you say that, get ahead of it. It's what Innovation Rodeo is all about. And now it's time for the last pitch. And I'm not going to say that we saved the best for last, but Staff Sergeant Anthony Davis has got something that I cannot wait for this panel of judges to hear. J.D., are you ready? We can't wait to see Anthony. We're excited to see him. Okay, so let's bring him out. The final pitch of Innovation Rodeo 2022, Staff Sergeant Anthony Davis. Finally, at McDill Air Force Base. Okay, what do I got to do? I have to get my gear from LRS. I have to uh, check my kids in at the CDC. What else? What else? I have to meet my new leadership. Okay, and then uh, I have to pick up a car today. I think I might be able to make it to the gym around 8.30 tonight. All right, I'll get my card. Eh. What? I registered at Kunsan. How come I don't have access here? Let me see the hours. I need to ask more questions. What are the... They're closed for five days because of a holiday and then training day. I can't miss five days. I just purchased this new workout regimen to help me lose weight. Also, I just bought a car today, so off-base membership is going to cost me more money. I want to take my kids to Disneyland because I haven't seen them for a year. I already got to this base, so I'm already stressing out. <clears throat> 
slide. Currently at fitness centers, they operate under individual systems. These systems cannot connect information from fitness center to fitness center. For example, if I was to get registered at Kunsan, if I wanted to go to Osan for a weekend trip, I'd have to re-register -re again, and that's three hours away. Also, they have unexpected upload times. At McDill, we had an upload overnight, and it deleted 2,000 of our patrons. Over the course of two weeks, these patrons have to re-register. What if one of these patrons had to go TDY? They would have to register again. <clears throat> the point of registration is to do it once. Every fitness center has the same rules. Make sure the door is shut. Don't let anybody in behind you. Are you over the age of 18? Slide. With this new web application, it would be connected to what we currently have, which is called Cloud One. This would cut down on maintenance costs. Also, 80 fitness centers already have existing capabilities, like the card scanners, the cameras. Just need a little push connected to the Cloud One. Let's talk about some of the pros. Like myself, I'm a shift worker. I have the possibility of working, at the, of working 12 hours a day. Midnight shift, not getting off till 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. But not only me, you have the defenders, you have the maintainers, maintainers. But let's focus more on readiness. Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Bass, once said, as airmen, we focus too much on PT tests, but we should focus more on fitness and readiness. Tying it back to my story, would I be ready if I'm mentally unstable because I can't financially take care of my family or myself while I'm downrange? Slide. With the support of my team, and also the stakeholders, which is you, the patrons of our facility, people who come in and work, work out day in and day out. Slide. We're asking for a one-time investment of, of 970K, 75K, sorry. But you will save annually $400,000. Can you, boop, help me open the doors? Questions? <laughs> we are super proud of you. We know this isn't your comfort zone. You got up here with a smile, gave a flawless pitch with all of the things that have been asked for you. You were clear in your concept and all of the things that you've been working so hard on over this last week. But what we're most proud of is the voice of the airman and the user and the customer and getting white space back for all of those uh, people that are our, our stakeholders and that we care about, Anthony. So really great job. Thank you. I'll go to the judges for some questions. Anthony, it looks like there's just one of me, but I represent uh, a whole host of gym rats. <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you, this is, this is uh, phenomenal. Thank you, regardless to where this goes from here. Uh, it, the connectivity is important, particularly as we travel. Uh, but DMDC and uh, Deers and all that other connectivity behind the scenes, uh, have you begun to talk to them about this at all just yet? Um, the company that they deal with, uh, we actually have scheduled to talk to them in the future. Okay. Um, so I'll, once we come up with questions of, uh, regarding that meeting, we'll get back with you. Sounds good. Yes, Thank you so much for this. Anthony, you did such a great job presenting. I, in my mind, I'm like, why haven't we done this already? So you, we walk past it all the time. We. And you put the passion and energy behind it. I really don't have a question. I just wanted to tell you that. Thanks for bringing it to this platform and making that pitch for all the airmen and guardians and authorized users that have had to deal with this issue. Um, thanks for being that voice. I think your idea is fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Anthony, I love it. I think it's great. It's needed. I'm a, I'm a semi-gym rat. I can't, claim, <laughs> I can't claim full on rat status. Tell me this. The 975 that you're asking for, tell me what that's actually going to buy us. I understand you want to put it into the cloud, but can you explain a little bit there? So the 975 would be more for if we would have to send um, like new hard drives to connect to Cloud One. Mm -hmm. So it would be to send uh, the maintenance personnel TDY to the bases. And, like I said, we, we have existing capabilities. Do we have to change those capabilities? Okay. Thank you. So TDY, um, is, it, is, is this intended for every, define the population, every Air Force base? Is uh, it every Air Force base that you would, the 975 would presumably so goes to? Currently, the 975 is only for the 80 bases that already have the capabilities. But in the future, 
because this can be enterprise wide, uh, we'll see about possibly getting more. Okay, so I mean, 80 is a big number. That's a good number of Air Force installations. Yes, and that, what I would offer, not, not as a question, but as a thought, would be um, there are joint bases. So you have airmen, you're passionate about airmen and guardians. Uh, there are joint bases that are owned, say, by the Army or the Navy. Wouldn't it be great if you could be an airman and you could go to an, and go TDY to a joint base owned by an Army installation or, whatever, or, or Army and actually use it as well? Or expand it DOD wide, right? Yes, so, um, and is real quick that is the card the envision is that envisioned to be a CAC? Is it envisioned to be a separate card, or what's the what's the actual card? That's a good question. So, uh, there's two separate cards at the moment. Uh, we, the one that I have right here. This will be for the uh, DOD civilians or spouses. Um, but uh, active duty military uh, reserves, they would use their uh, CAC. And one other thing I'll ask is, is uh, so one of your team members a technical expert on the systems? Yes, sir. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, one quick question. 400,000 savings annually, or what, what are we looking at? So the, so the money's for TDY to upgrade our systems. So what's the savings? What are we saving on? Uh, so once it's connected to the cloud, uh, it'll cut down on having to send uh, maintenance personnel TDY all the time to fix the, the software, um, that's, that's, what, that's what we're saving on. Thank so. you. Okay, there for us a good little discount card. <laughs> Andy, what do you see your big barriers as being for success? Um, big barriers can, we haven't uh, ran into any in, that, in our thought process just yet. Uh, but once we come up with some, we'll have to get back with you. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, and Anthony, thank you so much for uh, bringing this thought to us. As you can see, it resonates with the entire group. And if out uh, airmen like you, who are airmen and guardians like you, who are willing to step up and bring it to our awareness and work through this process to culminate on this stage today, uh, we wouldn't be moving things forward. So thank you again very much for all your time and effort and your passion on this. We appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. That's all in. Mr. J, I got to tell you, after the rehearsal this morning, they told me at lunch that based on his pitch, I should challenge you to a push up contest, but I don't want you to show me up right now. So, You're not ready. <laughs> I need that program installed now. Uh, Colonel, as, as, as the services kind of rep here between you and the chief, what'd you think about that? I think it's great. I think it's much needed. There is a demand signal. Even as we went into COVID and we had less people available, uh, we had to take folks out of fitness centers and put them into other locations where we needed military members. And that was a driving factor was folks wanting to go to the gym. I think it's much needed. The, the application is pretty simple, a little expensive on the front side, but it's simple really. Um, and every, every affected every person in the Air Force. I mean, your children, 18 and above, right? 16 and above, uh, spouses, everyone. It's a win for everyone. I like it. Absolutely. Chief, anything to add to that? I can definitely relate, right? PCS in here, middle of COVID. I wanted to go to the gym, couldn't go to the gym because the gym was closed. Uh, all, I had, all I needed was that cart, right? So definitely can relate uh, to it. And uh, so great pitch. Uh, Back with you, why haven't we done it? <laughs> if only we had some services center leadership <laughs> here. I know, right? Sponsor. In the room <laughs> to hear what's going on. No, it's a great point. Um, I'll tell you, so I, I was backstage. I was getting some texts from uh, some of his team mates at, at McDill, uh, who I've known through my career, and, and so they were rooting for him. So I think he did a great job. Um, but I think all eight of them did an absolutely fantastic job. J.D., anything to add? I think there is uh, some time here for us to deliberate as a panel. Um, and so I would like to open up with a couple of questions to the judges that I'd really like to drive in that deliberation. Does that sound like a good plan? That, that's a fantastic plan. I'm going to leave you guys to it up here on the stage. We're going to let you chit chat. Uh, I'm going to head backstage. I actually got a special guest back there. So uh, when you guys get to a point where you want to go behind closed doors uh, and shut these cameras off, I got some folks backstage to talk to. So JD, I'm going to leave you guys to it. Panel, judges, uh, thank you so much and here we go. Thanks Jason, we appreciate it. All right, I continue to be impressed and I see it from you guys as well. Uh, great questions, very probing, sticking it to them, but you can tell they came prepared and they've done their homework. 
Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, though, is some of the just innovation, groundbreaking. Some were like, why aren't we doing this already? But some were like, holy smokes, I didn't even realize that was a problem. So Chief, I'll start with you. What, what did you really think was a groundbreaking thought that maybe you were surprised to see? So I was surprised to see uh, really two of them, the network bandwidth expansion uh, at the capacity that we operate in DOD why haven't we done, why are we having this conversation, right? Uh, and, but the wearable Defender, uh, haven't spent many years and time downrange with the Defenders, uh, and it's just time to modernize, right? Uh, when we talk about um, cost-effective modernization and, and all those things, uh, may not be cost-effective at the beginning, but maybe a long range, we're saving money uh, through you know medical bills and, and equipment and all those things, so uh, those those are the two to me that right off the bat, right? All of them great pitches, all of them great ideas, all of them just innovation, innovation, innovation. Things that we we should be getting after. So I appreciate that, Chief. In my role, short time, albeit, but long time uh, installation and submission support stakeholder, if you will, we're great at incremental modernization. Just what's the next version of what I already have? So really appreciate your thoughts on. Uh, why those two were specifically a, a little bit more brown, groundbreaking in your mind. Thank you. Anybody else have anything that jumped out of them as really uh, groundbreaking? I, I really appreciated um, Craig's uh, putting autonomous vehicles on the airfield. Um, as a career mission supporter, the airfields are like the holy grail of safe zones, if you will. Um, and testing it and having other folks wanting to come see it and, and getting it and earning that trust and making leaders and users comfortable with that, I thought that was really, really innovative. Because it hasn't gone broadly, even nationally here, to have, uh, while we have autonomous vehicles with a person in it, um, we're not using it. And so I, I was really impressed with that thinking and, and what he's done to, to prototype it and, and more importantly, have it trusted. I was really impressed with that. And you might not have caught it, but he mentioned taxiway lights. As a civil engineer, those are a big deal than you might think. You don't ever want to break one of those bad boys. So that really resonated with me. If, uh, if anything that can prevent us from you know, knocking over something that we're not supposed to on the airfield is a huge win. And going out there in the dark of night when it's not going to interrupt the kind of daily operations to mow the grass or, or um, to plow the snow really, really resonated with me as well. Awesome. Thanks. Anybody else? I don't want to piggyback too hard on this one, but uh, autonomous vehicles in general and the potential to expand that to other areas, obviously I'm a defender, but I'm an airman first. Uh, there's so many potentials there, the cost savings that could be had if uh, maintenance and sustainment doesn't override that. Uh, the uh, opportunity to have uh, autonomous operations going on when our airmen aren't standing up at 3 a.m. in the morning doing the kinds of things that maybe automation can help us with. So I, I, uh, I thought that was pretty significant and uh, empathy for our airmen who might benefit from it. Mr. Jalavet, I think you're reading my mind because the second thread that resonated from the pitches to me was the most compelling in support of Airmen and Guardian and what came through was time, giving back time to our teammates, to our customers, all of the above. So how about in compelling, compelling in support to our, our customers? Did anything resonate uh, from you all in that space? Yeah, I'll tell you, I was thinking the same thing just now. It's about time, right? So all of these scenarios, I just went through each one of our, of our innovator pitch pitches, and each one of them had an element of giving time back. So it's that service before self farm taking care of the whole airman guardian family um, from, you know, the care of the resiliency to each and every one of those innovative ideas. I think it's a tough call, but you're right. It's the time, and that's what we value the most. Yeah. yeah. And if we're going to talk about time, again, um, the Defender Zone, th there's the potential there for better utilization of the limited S4 resources that we have so that through automation, whenever an individual wants or desires, they can obtain it. And uh, Anthony, again, just blew us away with, uh, yes, it is very difficult for the 24-hour operators, a host of first responders, uh, uh, to find the time to get in the same gym time that others might. Uh, yeah, critical.
And I'm thinking about Brandon and uh, merging all of those contracting systems together to not have a tracker to track the tracker that tracks the tracker. Uh, <laughs> just think about the quality of our, our contract oversight uh, as just a potential outcome as well uh, and giving that money back to that whole community so that we're getting more, um, more bang for our buck, truly. Smarter, not harder. I think it's cool that, that each person came with their career field <clears throat> their experience as the background that drove the innovation. We're fixing, you know, we're, we're improving defenders, we're saving time, we're trying to fix minds, if you will, spiritual health. I mean, those are, it's kind of cool that you see that broad gamut. Um, and as I think about, you know, judging, again, we talked about, about that they're, they're all um, quality um, proposals, but I think about the impact today versus the impact in the future. And some of the bets probably are more near term and some of the bets are probably more long term. The, um, the, um, the impact to airmen and guardians, some of the bets might not be felt as tangibly by airmen and guardians and, you know, at the base installation level and some might. And so it's just sort of interesting as you see through different lenses, they bring different value. And, uh, and it's, that's what makes it so difficult to try to figure out what, where we kind of want to place those bets but um, all very impressive. I think it's great how they, they are bringing in an idea and innovation based on their scope, right, on their capability, but something like Defender Zone, zone that we can look in, is gonna fix a Defender problem, but it has an LRS impact if we move it forward, right? It has a maintainer impact, so just something that they see working on the ground today themselves, it can solve many other, other problems, so. Uh, great, great pitches all around. All right, are you ready for the next round, which is a little harder? We're going to talk about the actual details and whittle this down to three winners. Are you guys uh, ready for that step? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Jason, are we ready for our special, special guest in the background so we can do a little bit of deliberation on this side? What do you think? Okay, so we are backstage here at the uh, Tech Port Center and Arena, Port San Antonio. And I have, as I said, a very special guest, Major Jackie Vasta, all the way back from uh, Colorado Springs now uh, to talk to us about Kinder Spot and kind of where you were. You're the 2020 Innovation Rodeo 2020 winner, Jackie. Great to see you. Thank you, Jason. It's so great to be here. It's been an awesome week getting to watch everyone work on their ideas and seeing their performances today. I'm just as impressed as I was when I participated in the competition so it's awesome awesome so we got to see your video right before the intermission of the show and, and your pitch and, and kind of you winning and, and getting the uh, getting the, the the award from uh, General Wilcox the the previous Air Force IMSC commander so uh, tell us kind of the last two years what have you been up to with Kinder Spot well first of all Kinder Spot is a live app that you can download in the App Store and we have it launched right now to nine different installations and we have over 1800 registered users so in the last two years we have just been going, hitting the, the ground, running, getting this app into the hands of uh, 1,800 users with 600 successful matches so far in the app. Well, it's a, it's a fantastic program. It's a fantastic innovation. Uh, you and I were talking earlier as, as a father of kids who, who at one time were in the CDC, um, you know, and just being able to have that flexibility to, to lease out your spots and stuff. Uh, very, very well done. So what's next for Kinder Spot? So we're going to continue our expansion to more bases so we can get that network built so that families can list their spots for rent and take advantage of saving some money and sharing care. Excellent. And so let's let's transition from kind of what you've been up to to what you've seen today for Innovation Rodeo 2022. You got a chance to hang out with the with the contestants and, and everything. Uh, what are your thoughts on on Innovation Rodeo 2022? They definitely took it up a notch this year. I mean, the production here at Techport SA has been so cool. I, I just, it brings back so many memories of being in the spotlight and the adrenaline, and this is just over the top. I love it, and I can't wait to see what they do next year. Excellent. Any, any advice to our, our eight teams as they sit in their dressing rooms waiting for the final announcement? What, what do you think they're feeling right now? 
um, praying, scared, excited. I think I was back there in my head just like, you know, whatever comes next, it's going to be amazing because IMSC Ventures and the entire team with IMSC is just amazing. And the ideas will go somewhere. You just have to trust the process. Hey, you got to trust the process. Eight fantastic ideas. Uh, they got the coaching. They've given their pitches. Now it's just up to the judges. Jackie, any last things you want to add to us? Yeah, I really want to say hi to Charlotte and Bobby, my kids, six and four, and also my husband, Rob. Love you guys. All right. Uh, Major Jackie Vasta, we are yeah, – we are really uh, happy to have you here. So, so uh, good to see you and, and glad you were able to make the trip and uh, at least back to San Antonio for a week or so. Yeah, thanks, Jason. All right, thank you. So I'm getting word uh, we go in. Oh, we're gonna get, we're gonna check in. So uh, the judges actually need a little bit more time uh, to deliberate. I, we knew it was gonna be a hard choice. So uh, what we're gonna do? We're just gonna check on the contestants and see how they're feeling. Let's bust in here real quick and uh, see. Yeah, they're uh, they're hanging out. Uh, so it was the, our last two contestants to go. So we got Sergeant Davis and Sergeant Trumman. How you guys feeling? Fantastic. Glad it's over. Yeah. Uh, your pitch, I, I think, went well. I watched. Um, you know, how how did you feel while you were up there? Oh, a little nervous. It's a weird one. All the the lights are sitting there hitting you in the face, but felt pretty good. Okay, uh, Sergeant Davis. You know they they raved about the fact that you were out of your comfort zone. That you got up on the stage. You gave a pitch. I got a text from my friend who's watching live on the live stream. Said he did an awesome pitch. Tell him good job. So there you go. Good job. H how are you feeling? I'm feeling the same, relieved, you know, it's, it's done, and now we just wait. <laughs> now we wait, and it's all up to the judges, right? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. outstanding, you guys. Uh, hopefully we'll have word soon. We're going to go ahead and hit up the next room. You guys hang tight. All right, let's go. Uh, we'll go to this dressing room next. This is our first set of uh, – First set of pitchers. Here we go. All right. Uh, we haven't talked to you guys in a minute. It's been a little bit. Yeah. How are you guys feeling? I'm feeling good. Yeah. Just waiting, uh, waiting to hear from the judges, seeing uh, who they're going to decide this year's winners. Yeah. All right. H how are you feeling, Chaplain? You uh, said a lot of prayers. So many prayers, and honestly, I didn't fall off the stage, so all my prayers came true. <laughs> well, you know, that was a concern because, uh, you know, making sure that safety comes first. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you feel that Innovation Rodeo 2022 has gone for you? It's gone so well. I've learned so much about the difference between just giving a brief and uh, doing pitch training and trying to sell an idea to somebody. Yeah, it's just mind-blowing. Yeah, it's quite the difference. I think one of our other contestants said, you know, throwing away 17 years of what they knew to do military briefings and, and give a pitch. And, and uh, Chaplain, uh, what are your, your final thoughts here before we jump into the next room? Honestly, just that this whole week I've gotten to know all the other contestants, and I want all of us to win. All their ideas are so good. I'm sure that's why the judges are taking so long, because I wouldn't be able to decide. All right. We gave some of the other contestants an opportunity. I'll give you guys the quick opportunity. Anybody you want to give a shout-out that's watching on the live stream? Just my lovely wife, Brittany. Thank you so much for the support. I love you. All right. How about you, Chaplain? Jessica, thank you so much for all your support this week. Toby, Lily, I love you guys. Ellie, I'm looking forward to dinner tonight. All right. All right. So uh, you guys just hang tight. As uh, soon as we get the word, uh, we'll let you guys know. All right. Let's, uh, let's keep moving through our backstage area here. Uh, we're going to jump into the dressing room right here. And these guys are hanging out, having some Sierra mist and some water. And uh, God, come on in uh, there, camera, and we'll, uh, we'll talk to these guys. Colonel Kramer, yes. how you feeling? Great. Again, it's over, so now we'll just wait to see what the results are. But although it's a competition, I think we've all become friends. And as we've heard other pitches, we're like, they should win. So I think we're all walking away with, with a win here. Excellent. How, how do you feel that your pitch went up on stage? Uh, hopefully okay. Um, yeah, again, I think that the nerves were still there, but a week's worth of training and repetition. And so hopefully I got my point across and at least advocated for the effort that we're working on. Okay, excellent. Sergeant Whitehead, how, how are you feeling? What, what are you thinking about uh, the way your pitch went? Uh, I think it went all right. It could have went a little better in my, in my mind, but I'm happy with it. Okay, and uh, the, the questions that the judges asked, they, they drilled you a little bit. Uh, what did you think? Uh, did you feel prepared to answer their questions? Uh, some of them, yes, very prepared. Some of them kind of caught me off guard. Okay, um, we gave some of the other contestants an opportunity. I want to give you guys a chance. Anybody you want to give a shout-out back that's watching the live stream? Yeah, I'll start with my wife, uh, Lauren. Look right in the camera for me. There you go. <laughs> Lauren, if you're watching, hi. But more importantly, not more importantly, take that back. <laughs> Whoa, that was a little bit of a slip. Yeah. 
But uh, just the MBE, MBE team back at Eglin, uh, they've always been finding a way to get to yes, and there's a small group back there that have made this a reality, so I just really, I'm here representing them, so I just want to give a shout out to the team. Okay, excellent. All right, Sergeant Whitehead, who do you want to give a shout out to? This time, I'll shout out my parents and my wonderful team at RF Cotton. Okay, excellent. Thanks, you guys, so much. Uh, hang tight. Uh, we're hoping to have a decision from the judges here very, very soon. All right, let's go ahead and hit this last dressing room here. And hopefully uh, we're going to get word from the judges pretty quick. We're coming on in. All right. Hey, how we doing? All right. Wally Wallace, uh, with your, your, your uh, communications, uh, you know, we talked after you left the stage that we, we in the warfighter world like to say the first thing that happens is your calm goes out. Thought your pitch was fantastic. How do you feel it went? Uh, it was a little rough. I, th I thought it was a little shaky, but caught it in there in the middle and we moved on. Okay. The the judges, man, they really grilled you with the questions. What uh, what did you? <laughs> I feel like everybody was like softball, 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 and then all of a sudden high alive. Just, right. Say so hit you with that uh, the Cobra Kai crane kick there. Um, how do you feel that you you your interaction with the judges went? I think we were, we're pretty well, pretty well. I think we need to follow back up on some stuff, but I think we'll get there. Okay, great pitch. I think you did a great job. Anybody you want to give a shout out back uh, back home? All oh, the misses, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Nicole and the three kids. So miss you, honey. All right. Thank you so much. Come on, Craig. Come on up here and see how you're feeling. Listen, robot lawnmowers. I, I'm all in, man. I am all in. I told him on the stage after you left. Nothing says innovation like robot tractors. I mean, I'm in. Uh, great pitch. How, how do you think it went? I think it went okay. You know, there's always room for improvement, but I think it went well and we got the points across. Okay. How do you think your interaction with the judges went? I think it went rather well. There were a few tough questions, but overall I think we answered them and got the judges what they needed. Okay. Fair enough. What's going through your head as you sit backstage waiting to find out an answer of where we're at? Just the waiting game. You know, let's get it going. Let's find out. Okay. So. All right. Yeah. Well, we're hoping to get an answer pretty quick. We're, we're, we're hoping to get an answer pretty quick. It looks like it's a tough choice. We're, we're getting word from our, our, our stage producers back here that they're actually going to give us a five-minute countdown. So we're going to be back in five minutes to announce the winner at Innovation Rodeo 2022. Welcome back to Innovation Rodeo 2022. I am your host, Jason Seibel, from the Air Force Security Forces Center, Air Force IMSC. It was harder than they thought it was going to be, folks. We are back with the judges. They have made a decision. J.D., come on up. I'm turning it over to you. Thanks so much, Jason. All right. It's my honor and a pleasure to announce the third place winner for the 2022 AFIMSC Innovation Rodeo as Staff Sergeant Dylan Whitehead with Defender is on. Dylan, come on out. Woo! Woo! Congratulations, Dylan. Super awesome. Yep. <laughs> Congratulations, Dylan. Great job. All right, hang out over here by us. We'll be back. All right, drum roll, please. Thank you. In second place, we have Staff Sergeant Anthony Davis with 24-Hour Fitness Access. Come on out, Anthony. All right, 
One of the moments we've all been waiting for, the winner of the 2022 AFIMSC Innovation Rodeo, Autonomous Vehicle Operations, Mr. Craig Redenauer. All right. Hey! Robot tractors. Almost does it for Innovation Rodeo 2022. But before we get out of here, JD, why don't you come on up here next to me? I think there's one last piece of business that you want to address besides our top three winners who did an outstanding job. And I think we ought to maybe give them one more round of applause. But what else do we got to add here? I am super proud to have seen all of the hard work months, 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 and then up to this week that not only our winners, but our entire group of eight finalists. And why I am so excited is my honor to announce not only that the winners are walking away with money, dedicated project management support, and contracts, that all eight finalists will receive dedicated project management support from the installation and mission support AFIMSE Ventures team to continue to move their projects forward. One of the things we've seen in the innovation space is that people often feel that they're out there alone, beating down barriers. I'm super excited to announce our team will be supporting all eight finalists to move their projects forward. So the rodeo is not the end for anyone, and I'd love for all eight finalists to join us out here on the stage so we could give them a round of applause and recognize them as well. Okay. Come on out. All right, JD, thank you. Judges, thank you so much. Uh, that's going to do it. It's an excellent job. What an outstanding event today. I think everybody can agree that every year we do Innovation Rodeo, it just gets that much better. I can't wait to see what the updates on these eight programs are, are going to be across the enterprise. You all uh, out there in, in the virtual uh, land and, and watching on the live stream, stay tuned to the Air Force Installation Mission Support Center's the social media on Facebook and LinkedIn to keep track of what's happening here. And remember, if you have an idea out there in the enterprise, it is just a pitch away from getting it supported for with program support and everything else through AFIMSC. And uh, check out the uh, website that's right here on the screen, and that will get you linked in and, and set up for success. Uh, that's going to be it for now for myself, for the judges, for Major General Allen. Thank you so much for tuning in to uh, IMSC uh, Innovation Rodeo 2022. We'll see you all next year. Yeah!